Hear ye, hear ye! The Parliament of Geek shall now come to order! And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Parliament of Geeks, our inaugural new expansion of the Monastery Podcasting Empire. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me at the war table, I am joined by three of, of my good brothers in arms. We have the we have the man in blue the man in blue who is not from Gotham. G good brother Matty. We have the man in red who is who is not from Metropolis. Good brother Shades. And we have the man in black who is not the Undertaker. Good well, brother. Nor am Sanders. I Johnny Cash. <laughs> <laughs> good brother Xanatrix. Who is who is wasted no time in trying to bane my existence? <laughs> Some things never change, my friends. New sh new show, same new show, same dance. <laughs> new show, same old shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, except except ours is act is except is ours. Unlike Junior, is actual good shit. Oh, hey! Does that make us part of all elite then? Damn right. May as, may, as well after the, may as well after the Exodus trilogy on Geek Watch. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> My soapbox made it clear the shades is all linked. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Bes besides, um, the monastery is not too bad. Is not too terrible of a name for it for a stable. Um, <laughs> but. So before we even get into what into the matter. Zen, would you mind would you mind educating the br the brothers and sisters of the temple? What exactly is the Parliament of Geeks? So, friends, enemies, ladies, gentlemen from all around, the Parliament of Geeks is the place where we, the esteemed members of the monastery, pass judgment on certain pieces of media that we know and love. Usually visual media. This week in our inaugural, inaugural episode, we are passing judgment on the legend of Vox Machina. And it comes to two things. Two simple things. Will the legend of Vox Machina be Reeb? Or will it be Scrub? We shall watch, find out, and the judgment comes forth. We prepare for these with some watches prior to the episode, and now we have collected our thoughts and are ready to begin the deliberation process. And as once was tradition and, and shall be tradition again, and I have been waiting about two years to say, to say this. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed, bro esteemed brothers of the War Council, esteemed brothers and sisters of the Parliament, Rise for your drinking anthem. Skull, motherfucker. Skull. Cheers, bitches. You're not the only one who's been waiting a couple of years for me to shout. Sally Yellowhorn! Ah, it's good to bring that back. Oh <laughs> yes, figured, it is, my good friend. <laughs> I figured this would. I figured this is the perfect opportunity to bring to bring back. An old chestnut from the Monastery Live days that I couldn't fit into Geek Watch. But for the Parliament, it is the perfect setting. Yes. So. I suppose I suppose we need to... I usually open up whenever I do interviews with talking about the humble beginnings. And I think we need to do that in, the, in this instance. So first... Now, obviously we will be treading some familiar ground... Um, covering some of the stuff that you covered on the Soapbox episode. But we do need to talk about cr Critical Role before we even get to 
talking about the Vox Machina animation. Yes. Shall I? <laughs> so let's set, let's set the stage, and then we can get then we can give our thoughts and experiences regarding Critical Role specifically. I will have to revisit a few old chestnuts, but it's Im it's imperative to set the stage. Then shall I take this one, my friend? Go right ahead. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So yes, for those of you who have likely heard the story, because I know the monastery is full of those dice rollers out there. Yes, The Legend of Vox Machina is, of course, based on the popular Dungeons & Dragons streaming series Critical Role, where, as the DM himself, Matt Mercer, lovely put it, where a bunch of nerdy-ass Voigtbatch sit around and play Dungeons & Dragons. Now, the history of this series goes back Mr. a long Speaker. way... Should we should we do the thing they do when Matt Mercer does introduce the the show and scream? We we play Dungeons and Dragons. It's uh, it, 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 <laughs> brief, very brief history lesson here. Again, this started back in. It actually started way back in about 2010 when they uh, a bunch of these guys were playing at home, but they weren't streaming it. A couple years later, they ran a few streams after uh, one of the players had a birthday that day. They streamed it live. Thought it was fun. Tried doing it for a while, but it was kind of hit or miss. Then Geek and Sundry picked it up back in about 2015. And that's when they've been... Up until that time, they've been playing Pathfinder. But, of course, they had to hit the mass appeal. So they switched to D&D &D 5 Edition, which gave, uh, gave Matt Mercer a few headaches. Because he had to homebrew a character. <laughs> uh... But regardless, it was a smash success and has continued on to this day, though as of 2019, they are now on their own, no longer part of Geek Ascendry. And so they're just kind of doing their own thing. They've done a whole bunch of crazy shit. I have done a soapbox video on Critical Role over on my channel if you want to go see, really get the details on things and learn a little bit more. But what we are going to be focusing on is a adaptation of the very first campaign they did, Vox Machina. So we're going to be introducing a lot of those characters, going through that storyline. Uh, we obviously won't be going into the later parts of that campaign, because this really only covers like the first couple of arcs of Vox Machina. But I would honestly have probably been a little concerned if they tried to do the entire campaign in 12 episodes. We already put up with that bullshit with SAO Season 1. We d yeah, we're we not doing that again. <laughs> I mean, we're not we're not putting up with SAO bullshit whatsoever because Reki Kawahara has already been judged upon before. He's scrub. He's scrub of the lowest tier, mm -hmm. and I won't hear anyone else say anything about it. And I mean, if you I try, you're just you're just arguing it from me. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the argument. fact I think let's not forget that a couple of years ago we we buried him over that whole, over that whole dot hack ripped me off argument he made. Yes, yeah, he's never letting that down. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, any of you out there, anyone watching, if you think Reki Kawahara is not Scrub, come at me. Your balls are mine. <laughs> oh, God. I will happily oh, serve you. Not not <laughs> I wasn't able to yeah, serve right. as mediator. The, I wasn't able to serve as mediator the last time we had one of these situations years back because a, because a certain professor decided to um, pull pull the absolute bitches of bitch moves. But if somebody <laughs> if somebody wants to go if somebody wants to try and defend Reiki and is for and is is willing to trade verbal blows, I will happily be the mediator for that. <laughs> <laughs> but just be prepared because say... and I will come in guns blazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when it comes to this temple, it's very simple. If you think Reiki, whatever this this douchebag's name is, is right, the answer is no. You're fucking wrong. <laughs> no, they're, wrong, they're wrong, but I'm but I welcome the, I welcome the attempt. I'd yes. rather I'd rather. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Easy would say it says says it best. While you may be wrong in your opinion, it, it I will defend the right for you, for you to say it. <laughs> it. Just don't expect us to just allow it without some without consequence. Mm -hmm. And, and us laughing our, our asses off at your face. Yeah. Or anyway. one of our favorite sayings. Never, never interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. Indeed. Anyway, rails, oh, yeah. guys. Rails. Yeah. Getting back, <laughs> getting back on the rails. Um, before, before we get, before we get into, um, critical. Before we get into the le the um, fact that they were slack jawed at at the response when it came to the crowdfund for Vox Machina. <laughs> Oh, we'll get, I, I know you we'll laughed your to, ass off at that. We'll get to, we'll get to that in a minute. You. <laughs> um, I do want I do want to touch on the cultural impact from my perspective of 
um, critical role. First off, having having to homebrew something because the core rules do, because the core rules don't support what you wanted to do. Um, no disrespect, Matt, but um, I got to hit the tightest button. No, uh, you know what? I'm actually going to belay that because that's just my me saying that. I'm pretty sure he had no problem doing that. I just had to make the crack the joke because, yeah. of course, yeah, he had to homebrew a character because in Pathfinder they have gunslingers. In Dungeons & Dragons, they do not. <laughs> well, I, think Monk was more at the, mm-hmm. I, I think Monk was more getting at the fact that he, people like him and I, who have been forever DMs for 20 plus years, have had to homebrew sometimes multiple things into a system that it doesn't gene work in and still make it all work seamlessly. Mm-hmm. Hey, and, and to be fair, Matt's no spring chicken. He's had he's gotten some experience in DMing. Like, you know. Yeah. We, we can knock some aspects of Critical Role, and we have some things to say. In fact, I already said a few of myself already. Yep. But it's not Matt's fault specifically on a lot of things. It's no, a case with, of it's the impact of the, he created. With a lot of that's well, with, with, with the conversion stuff, a lot of that I blame on Merles and Crawford for being idiots. But that's, yes. on, that's on the Wantsy end of things, and Merles is an idiot. I know, <laughs> I know, he's, got, I know he's got his defenders, but... He, but um, he is still the same guy who tried to take credit for some of the, for some of the things he wasn't involved in back in 2008. He's yeah. always been a, he's always been a third wheel kind of guy, and to steal a line from um, from from Miss from the meme face of 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 wrestling before he became an a, before he became an asshole. If you were to walk into a room with actual game designers, he'd be whistling "Stranger in Paradise." <laughs> exactly. But no, the the cult the, obviously, as I'm sure anyone who's even heard of Critical World knows, because this series became a massive success. I mean, they already had the drawing power of some top tier voice actors. I mean, we're talking Laura Bailey, Travis Willingham, Leo Bryan, Sam Regal. Mm-hmm. You know, e- even guys like uh, you know, and Ashley Johnson. Even you know, you know, despite the game that she's most known for these days, not always being the best, she does a great job. And even guys like Talison Jaffe and uh, uh, Marisha Ray are. Awesome people, you know, and of course Matt Mercer is the DM. I mean this this guy's done everything mm-hmm. for, <laughs> at this point. For those of you who uh, who don't know or don't recognize those names, just go point a finger at a video game or an anime or anything really, and I'm sure you'll find one of them. Yeah, y- you, yeah, you, you'll find them somewhere. They're not hard to find their work around. <laughs> <laughs> the, the group, like, the group, the group of them have worked a lot. Yeah, they've done a lot in their time. But Critical Role has been the, their go-to thing to do for ages now. And for good reason. Because like because of the fact that they are practically legends in voice acting at this point, they have the idea of how to improvise, how to act, how to perform. They know how to put on a fucking show. Mm-hmm. And of course, so does Matt. Matt is very great at that. In fact, he's been creating characters... Uh, out of pulling them, pulling them out of his ass for years. I mean, one of the first big things he got known for was a web series that basically turned Super Smash Brothers into There Will Be Blood. <laughs> yep. So he knows how to change. He knows how to create characters out of nothing. So that combination of things allows them to be able to do things that most D and D tables aren't gonna do. Which is where Monk's probably gonna be going with this point. With one of his points is that. You cannot expect D and D to go this good. <laughs> See, here's here's the thing. A lot of people seem to have this idea that I dis- that I despise Critical Role, be- especially given the especially given the story I've told about the no Matt Mercer sign at my LGS. Oh, that sign that sign was first, which that sign was just was just something just something that came up in jest. I didn't think I'd actually see it. The problem that the problem that I've had is. As all of you know, I am very passionate about the art of tabletop gaming. Yep. And the whole reason I even started my channel is because is because I wanted to be the change I wanted to see when it came to helping the tabletop gaming scene grow and flourish. Not just D&D, but the entirety of it. Especially the stuff outside of that 20-sided bubble. And because... Be- because of the fact that I would frequently see people coming in with the expectation that a game like that would would be similar to it, 
My concern has my concern has always been has always been the long term effects. The ex the biggest case the biggest case in point is the fact that the fact that a lot of people think a lot of people have thought that the pop that um because of how Critical Role has expanded the popularity of the hobby, that it means that the hobby is now more accept more accepted or something like that. When reali reality speaking, that's not the case. The big problem that I have is that is the fact that somebody's gonna come somebody's going to try and so a new group of people is going to try and replicate that, not going to be able to do it, and they're not gonna, they're not going to stick around, and they're just going to what they're just going to watch, and when when they inevitably end up jump end up jumping to another end up jumping to another system, especially especially given that a sixth edition is all but inevitable, as I've talked about in the past, um, a lot of the a lot of the people that got into D and D through this show, they're not going to stick around. I li I liken it to what happened with the Nintendo Wii, where they where they got a huge install base, but that install base wasn't going to stick around because all that they were going to play was just the Wii Sports that came bundled with the thing. Exactly. This is why I'm actually kind of glad that I that I joined a few games with Monk before I ever started watching Critical Role because that meant that I got an idea of what an actual game is like. Before seeing how these guys did it and seeing how different it is. Mm -hmm. And by the yeah. way, some of those games, some of those games on Critical Role have gone sideways in some certain cases. Oh, Sometimes yeah. it's just the luck of the dice. The dice gods shine on them, and then every once in a while, the dice gods show no mercy. Yeah, amen. <laughs> However, this is also you'll recall that I that um during during that one shot I watched with you. Where Sam Regal, cringe lord that he is, was D was DMing. I actually gave that praise for being a much better representation of what DMing a tabletop game is actually like. Yeah, for those who are wondering, uh, it's a more recent guest battle royale that Sam DM'd, where all the other players were not the usual players. They were all guests, voice actors who helped out in the Legend of Vox Machina. So they joined in, and some of them have been previous guests on Critical Role in the past. But they all came together and did this battle royale type thing, and yeah, it did, it went completely off the rails almost immediately. <laughs> which is far more, which is far more indic is far more indicative. I've had I've had a saying for the longest time, one that I stole from my mentor. A novelist is shorthand for a shit DM. Yeah. <laughs> and the big reason that's I say, go ahead. I was gonna say that's not knocking on novelists. No. But no. it's more to do with the fact that a lot of people have this idea that when you're that when you're sitting down for a game for a game of D and D or anything else, your that the DM is writing a, is writing some kind of story. You are not George Martin, thank God. You're not Tolkien. Yeah. You're not Moorcock. You're not e you're not Lieber. You're not even Howard. If you really want to do that, then write a novel. Yeah. The idea, like, from what I've learned from my own experience with working with Monk and seeing other things like, you know, a lot of videos talking about uh, the Reddit, pa Reddit page r slash RPG Horror Stories, mm -hmm. is the basic thing you want to do is have a, a, a basic plan in, uh, in, in, in mind, have an, an idea of your setting, your world, and, like, your general where you want the story to go, but never be so locked in on it. Be prepared to improvise. Because you never know what your players are going to do, and your players could take your story in an entirely different direction. So have a general idea of what you want to do, but be ready to improvise at any moment. There was an interview uh, that Matthew Mercer was uh, with uh, the YouTube channel Dungeons & Dragons. I think it's the official one. And they were explaining it. They were asking what was his favorite moment from... Uh, from uh, campaign three was, and I'm like, well, that's a little early to do that. But at the same time, and he goes on on, okay, being on his toes, talking about some of the agents of chaos. Ashley Johnson as Fern is a glowing example that he brings up. The point is, like Matthew Mercer plays plays it off at this is intended, but even he's thrown for a loop every once in a while. Yeah, which is a good thing. It, it just shows you that. 
even at his level of experience, which is, you know, very experienced, of course, even, even he's got moments of, oh, where are you going with this shit? <laughs> which is not a bad thing. The ide- the ideal approach that I usually tell people if you if they want to do a um, campaign as it, as if it's a season of a television show is to take the tears and tentpoles approach that gargoyles did. For those for those unaware, because tears and tentpoles, which was an internal um, internal term for the episode structure that gargoyles used during its TV airing. Um, I'm not counting the Goliath Chronicles because nobody should count the Goliath Chronicles. The what now? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) But it's the fact that TV stations hate serialization. And they wanted to do serialization, but TV stations love and and higher-ups love um, putting episodes in any order. Tears and Tentpoles was the compromise. The idea being you have two... Type, you have two tiers of episodes. You have story episodes that have to be placed at this at this point in the airing order, but you have these secondary ones that you can place in any order between those te- between those tentpole episodes. In the same in the same vein, have larger moments that ha- that have to be that ha- that have to advance the story, but little moments that you can put in between those those areas. That's the advice I usually give people. And that's what, and, and and you know, if you really actually look at how Critical Role works, they do that too. Mm-hmm. You know, they you know there are times where Matt will set will basically describe a scene that he's saying basically time to get serious. It's time to get back onto the story because we got things going on. Mm-hmm. But then when things are slowing down a little bit and they got some free time, he, he lets these guys just kind of branch out and have a little fun, just do whatever they want, yeah, and get, just kind of guide, just kind of guiding that along. It's pretty, it, and that's, I'm going to be honest, that's actually pretty par for the course when it comes to DMs in general. Knowing yeah. when to apply the hints to return to a more serious moment and when to allow your players a little more um, levity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, levity and freedom. Now, with all the, with all that said... That bring that brings us to the origin story of of this animation project because original originally this was intended to be a crowdfunded project that was not going to have as many episodes that they had planned. I think they were only asking. Uh, for... I'm going to stop you right there because you are missing a point. You missed an earlier point. They actually originally had been pitching this to studios mm-hmm. as an idea, but no studio was willing to pick it up. They had actually been pitching it for like a good couple, like a year or two, mm-hmm. but no studio would pick it up. Then they decided, okay, we'll just do a simple one episode special and do a Kickstarter for it. Mm-hmm. But they had, and they put out a, a reason for a, 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 a full on animation special. They put out a reasonable budget. 77, it was like seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, three quarters of a million. Yeah, three dollars. quarters of a mil. Yeah, which for is... an animation budget that's small, but it's understandable. Yeah, and for 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 a point of contrast, a single episode of Avatar: The Last Airbender cost about a million dollars. So reasonable enough that you know the actors pro or, uh, for the actors, it's a passion project, so they could eat a loss on this one just just to have fun with it. And hey, I made a cartoon about my D and D character, that kind of stuff. Exactly. Mm-hmm. However, not even they could have expected what happened next because. Day one of this Kickstarter, the day they launch it, they don't just have passed that goal. They don't just hit that goal. They go way past to the tune of $3 million on their first fucking day. Which resulted in the infamous moments when they were... In order to hype the launch, they were going to do a bit of a Q&A. But as soon as, they hit, as soon as they hit go, they had already hit their goal and were going way past that, so... There was a moment of, I'd say about a minute or two of them just literally the first slacked. seconds. Yeah, the first minute. They're just completely slack jawed and dumbfounded. Do you just see Marisha Ray, Matthew Mercer, and Travis Willingham just sit in there, just like, <laughs> like literally, uh, freaking uh, Travis does a full, like as soon as it, like he, you see this panning shot. 
Murray's just, just sitting there like, what the fuck? It just has this look of, the fuck just happened? Mm-hmm. Matt, Matt's just sitting there just completely dumbfounded. He's just like, Mercer.exe huh? not found. Yeah. And, and then you cut to, tra- and then it pans to Travis, who, who just does a full, <laughs> yeah. There's only one word that describes this type of scene. It is a word not used very often, and it is a word that I love and needs to be used more often, but in the proper context. What happened to them is they had been gobsmacked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is the word. That I is love that word. word. I mean, they they've even said they expected to hit their goal pretty fast. They weren't they were expecting to be do, to do a pretty decent job on this Kickstarter. But no no one could have expected to hit three million dollars in their first day. That's just you don't expect that. Mm-hmm. And for and, and then of course from there Kickstarter, you know, of course, of course, they're not going to stop the Kickstarter there. If they can make more, they're going to fucking make more for it. Mm-hmm. Final total ended up being eleven million dollars, which set, which set a crowdfunding record. And unlike uh, unlike certain other crowdfunding records, actually deliver act- was actually delivered upon in a timely manner. Hi, Star Citizen. I still hate you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they Star Citizen promised, is like, still a scam. Oh yes, no argument here, but. They 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 had, so a lot of the stretch goals they had promised were going to be special one shot episodes. Now, one smart thing they did was they made it so that even those stretch goal episodes were not going to be just for the Kickstarter backers. Everyone was going to enjoy them, but it was a thank you for their donations. To, you know, and and they did like a ton of these kick uh, one shots mm-hmm. and some pretty good ones to boot. I might add. So that was actually a really cool way to say thanks. But yeah, $11 million. Needless to say, they had to add some more stretch goals as time went on. Because, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But that also basically told them that doing a single episode was, like, $11 million? Even on a movie, that's a... Unless you're doing a full movie, that's a bit much. So they decided to, you know, well, all right, well, if we're going to have that much money, well, fuck it, let's just make a full series out of this. And, of course, now that, you know, studios started realizing, oh, shit, this could actually make money, Amazon comes a-knocking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the hey, 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 you, you have a series of people that want to watch it? Come on down. And Lord oh, knows, Amazon hey, needed a winning hey, series right now. With all the shit they anyway, can... we're in the same family. Yeah, that's probably how it got, how that happened. And, all, and let's be honest here, people. Amazon needed a winner. <laughs> they haven't exactly been doing well in their original oh. series game. I'd see. So, they, I think they, the closest to a big win, a big one, was Invincible, and that was a decent win. Yeah, but um, the pr- the problem is they needed they needed a lot of the things that have been wins have e- have either succumbed to seasonal rot or have or have been one and dones that can't be followed up upon because as Mm-hmm. As has been pointed out a lot, um, Netflix and Amazon and a lot of other streaming services rely on the "what happens next" philosophy. And with some, with something like Invincible, while there's definitely more stories you can tell, we we haven't heard hide nor hair about what about whether that's even going to be followed up. Stranger Things succumb to seasonal rot. The boys succumb to seasonal rot. Um, I'd say the I'd say a recent I'd say the only recent example of something that's doing well for itself, but not exactly a um not exactly a big needle mover is Reacher. I'd yeah. say it's, I'd say it's a better portrayal of Jack Reacher than um Tom Cruise did. Fuck Tom <laughs> Cruise. Fuck that movie. Tom Cruise, you are like five eight, black hair, blue eyes. Read the books. He's fucking 6'5", 250 pounds of pure muscle and blonde. Oh, hell yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Let's pull you back in there, Zan. Now, here's where I... <laughs> by comparison, let me explain why I think Vox Machina is going to be able to avoid that problem. Because one of the reasons why Seasonal Rot ends up becoming a thing is because they have to... Now that they know that they have another season coming, they have to come up with a whole new set of stories. And that can create problems. But... Critical Role doesn't have that problem. Their story is already there. They have it made. It's just sitting there. All they have to do is just adapt it properly, and they're golden. You know, we we could get at least, like, just for Vox Machina alone, we could probably get an extra two to three seasons out of this. And that's not even getting into whether or not they'd consider adapting um, the 
the adve the campaigns that they've done after that. Or even just some of the, or, or even just doing specials on some of the one shots. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to tell you this right now. If we get far enough, the search for Grog needs to be a special. <laughs> Which, by the way, folks, if you need an introduction to Critical Role, that's that's a good one. Also, it's a great, it's a, the roast of Grog, and and Grog gets the greatest rebuttal you could do in, in a roast. <laughs> yes, it is. Perfect in its setup. So, if you want an idea how good Critical Role is, the search for Grog is a great way to jump in. Mm. Anyway, but, but yeah, and, but yeah, and that's yeah. We can also do the Mighty Nine and now the the now newly named Bell's Hells <laughs> down the road that's if they want to keep this going. name right there. It really is. <laughs> so yeah, they have a lot of material to work with, and again, all those one shots they could do specials on with them. There's a lot they could do with this. Mm -hmm. Now, there is one aspect to this adaptation as... Uh, actually, no. I'm going to wait on that because we might have to get into that later. But the fact that this even happened at all is an amazing thing. Like, it shows just how pop, how um, uh, uh, awesome and popular Critical Role is and how much it deserves it, honestly. Again, we agree the, sol the, the culture unpacked on tabletop gaming might take a hit for this, and it really will in the long run, but... At the least for now, we can ride this wave and enjoy it and enjoy what it's giving us because this series, as you will come to learn, is something that has to be seen to be believed because of how well it was done. And with, the, with that in mind, I think this is as good, this is as good a time as any to co to cover um, to cover to cover the fir the first arc. <laughs> Or rather, the fir the fir the mini arc and the fir and the first proper arc, i.e., you know how you know how I you know how I joked about um about Sao season one. This is a case of doing that kind of thing properly. Mm. Mostly I um... because it was done mostly because the scrunching was done kind of reversed, even though it wasn't really scrunching. Yeah. yeah. Not to mention the introductory mini arc was actually a, a um, Chekhov's gun for for later. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it was. So yeah, the first arc is Craghammer and Vasselheim, uh, and this, and honestly, like we kind of skip over the Craghammer part a little bit. We mainly focus on Vasselheim because the first arc is, of course. The 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 uh, some mysterious creature is terrorizing the lands, and a lot of other hero groups have tried to stop this mysterious creature, and nobody can. In fact, they get the first thing you see is this, gr this other group of adventurers, your typical box standard D and D party, looking like you know the the serious kind, getting ready to grab this grand battle, and they get absolutely slaughtered. <laughs> Suplex City, the D and D version. Yeah. They get slaughtered. And what ends up... what? And of course, the, the, the leaders of Taldore, the Council of Taldore, is not happy about this. And they put out a wanted ad basically saying, Can we get an, is there any adventurers out there who would like to help us stop this thing? And this is when we get our first introduction to Vox Machina. Getting into a bar fight. Which, um... On one hand, I on one hand I love the fact that we start that one that some traditions never die, starting with starting with a group of people who have known each other for years and meeting at a tavern. <laughs> yeah. And I chug, 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 chug. I can't be I can't be mad at the, but the the reason why I prefer this particular approach, and I I think I think that's the re I think it's the reason why whenever I've used the, um, meeting at a tavern, this is. This is not far off from the way I approach things. Is the f is the fact that you don't have certain bad habits that some that some cliches would indicate, like say the like say the ranger skulking in the corner. Yeah. Oh, in this case, now, the ranger just... is getting sloshed. Say the only, yeah. The only person who's in the corner, even though even though he's not quite, is Percy. Yeah. He's just kind of doing his own thing. Well, no, there, there's one other person who's not amongst that amongst their <laughs> numbers at the yeah. moment. Uh, we, I'd like to take this opportunity to get, give you a warning right now, ladies and gentlemen. Do not watch this with your kids. <laughs> yeah. By the way, that warning is brought to you by tits. Why not? 
<laughs> we will get we will get into we will get into that in a in a bit because I have some colleagues who this was this was a point of contention, but that's not but again later. But I think this yeah. is a good of a this is a good of a time as any to intro to introduce the 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 and I can't I can't and this is the one time this actually applies merry band of misfits. Yes, yes, indeed. Allow me to help us go down the line because I've actually got the wiki, the uh, critical role wiki up here. Mm -hmm. Starting things off, we have Laura Bailey playing the role of Vexalia. Mm -hmm. She is the archer of our group, uh, and uh, she is basically. I, I, I guess if you were going to name any of these guys the leader, she would probably fit the bill because she's the one that usually has to keep all the other knuckleheads in line. Mm -hmm. Team mom. Yeah, she team mom. That is the exact description we're going for. Team fucking mom, mm -hmm. right here with with Vexalia. She is very serious. She, I mean, she can be lighthearted. She's not so so fucking serious, but she's the more serious one of the group, where she tries to keep everyone else in line and keep them keep their heads where keep their heads on straight, mm -hmm. preferably attached. <laughs> oh yeah. And she also has a pet bear. Hi, Trinket. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> a pet bear that is unfortunately almost never seen in the show. At least in this season. They don't really get much use out of them this season. <sighs> I'm pretty sure we'll get some scenes out of them before too long. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Uh, from there, we go to uh, Marisha Ray as Keyleth of the Air Ashari. She is our like, half-elf half -elf, actually, yeah, half -elf druid. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's... Actually, there's an interesting story regarding Keyleth because I, something I learned as I was watching videos about Critical Role and Legend of Vox Machina is that in the original campaign, people not only hated Keyleth because they hadn't seen the home games that they had done or all the earlier streams, all they had seen is the main, the, the original, the main series. They also ha they hated Keyleth so much they ended up hating Marisha Ray for the longest fucking time because. Part of the thing with Keyleth is that she's out to kind of basically, uh, she has to complete something called an Aramente. And she hasn't had the most, the most luck in regards to that getting up to this point. So she's kind of got a little bit of self-esteem issues going into this. As she did in the main campaign. But because nobody had seen the backstory and it wasn't really well integrated into the actual campaign... A lot of people just thought she was just unnecessarily annoying and incompetent. Mm -hmm. But this series actually works to fix that, kind of integrating a little bit of backstory into her character so that she becomes a lot more likable and, and you kind of start rooting for her as time goes on. <laughs> it, she just has the unfortunate luck of, of the fact that she can't hold her liquor to save her life. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just elf, have monk. one ale? <clears throat> monk, she's an elf. Tautology. Fair point. I don't know. <laughs> now, I don't, I accidentally skipped over this, but we have to bring up Liam O'Brien as Vaxel Dan, Vex's bro uh, twin brother. Mm -hmm. He is basically a rogue assassin. And uh, he, he, he comes off, like, he gives, he gives the look of somebody who is all business but do not let that dark and brooding look fool you. He's Fuck a sibling. He is a sibling. <laughs> he's a sibling, and he's also quite the prankster. Mm -hmm. He is. <laughs> I was just like, just watching a, a clip from near the end of the campaign where he pulls one hell of a prank, but I won't spoil it. I won't spoil it. It's it, But it's funny. Mm-hmm. Next up, we have Ashley's, Ashley Johnson as Pike Trickfoot, a deep gnome cleric who is, you know, she definitely tries to be, you know, she, it's interesting with, with Pike because on the one hand, she tries to be your noble, chivalrous, kind of you know, friendly kind of cleric character. But on the other hand, she's not afraid to drop a swear and get drunk and have a little fun. You want to know who she, you want to know who on some level she, I was reminded of regarding that kind of clericness? Uh. Have you ever seen um, Gensomad and Sayuki? <laughs> <laughs> she is she is very reminiscent yes. of Genjo Sanzo. Ah, uh, yes. 
the man who has has one of the most esteemed tit- one of the most esteemed titles in Buddha in Buddhism, and yet he yet he is a smoker. He is he is a he is a drinker. He is constant. He is constantly abusing Goku whenever he gets out of line with a paper fan. And, he has a gun, and he ha- and he has a and is armed with a banish armed with both a banishing gun and the and the Maten scripture. Um, yeah, which doesn't exactly hurt that his du- his dub voice is um, Dave Matranga. Oh fuck! <laughs> yeah, what are you, your boy, your boy. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, so Sanzo Sanzo is definitely the bit the best uh, comparison for Pike. That's true. Um, irreverent. And exuberant, mm-hmm. but still yeah. faithful. That's the best way to put it. And, and that, bec- that pays a big part of it. But I do want to take this opportunity to bring up <sighs> the fact that she is one of the first examples we have of the adaptation being forced to change names because of, well, licenses and copyrights. Because in the actual campaign, she is a follower of Saren Ray. Mm-hmm. However, they can't use the name Saren Ray in the sh- in the car- in the animation, so they instead just say that she is a follower of the Everlight, which might as well be the same thing. Yeah, it is the same thing, but it's a case of we can this we're call you know she's a follower of this, but we can't it's, call it that, so we're gonna call it this instead. It's legally, legally distinct. distinct. Thank you, Maddie. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, and for the for the record, um, they 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 were ab- they were able to be technically technically correct because. Um, one of one of Sarah and Ray's titles is the Everlight, but yeah, and titles she, cannot be subject to copyrights unless it is extremely specific. So, but she is usually associated with healing in the sun, and she is a deity from um, Pathfinder's universe. Yes. So obviously that had to be changed. Now, I have saved the three best for last. <laughs> Shall we start? Let's see, shall we start with the Bard, the Goliath, or, well, we'll save, we'll save the, we'll save, uh, the, the we'll Goliath save the other one for last. last. Mm-hmm. The Goliath should no, no, be no. last. No, no, no. We have to save Talison's character for last. Oh, uh, yeah, how... yeah, 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 good call, good call. So Besides, we start with the... <laughs> it's a good, it's, huh? it's a good idea to talk about the Bard and the Goliath at the same time, considering recent events, Jades. Mmm... <laughs> Yes, I, I, I yeah, yep, nope, I know what you're getting at now. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha, you. You're picking you. up what I'm putting down. That's good. Yeah, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Anyway, <laughs> so we will start with Sam's Sam Regal's character, Scanlan Shorthalt. The most typical bard stereotype to ever typical bard stereotype. <laughs> bar- really? I have referred to him as the bardiest bard since a bard's tale. <laughs> yeah, and for, for those who are not into in, uh, not that much into it, which is a short few, but if if you need a comparison, if Ric Flair was a bard, if Ric Flair was a D and D character, yeah, he 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 is known for his instruments, which he can use to cast his spells of inspiration and healing, and he also has quite the silver tongue that can either help with those inspirations, help them get out of situations, or. Help him get into a woman's pants. In some cases, the silver tongue is literally in her pants. Uh, (laughs) Long story short, woo! Yeah. Remember what I said earlier about how Scanlan wasn't with the rest of the crew? Guess what he was fucking doing? Well, you just answered your own question. Fuck him. Yes, I did, and I did that on purpose. Uh, Scanlan is the quintessential combination of the diplomancer plus the support caster plus the guy who tries to fuck everything with two legs. And we do mean and, everything. Quote, Scanlan yes. quote Jay from the from the views universe. He'll fuck anything that goddamn moves. He, he and he doesn't discriminate. He'll fuck a pretty looking guy, a pretty looking girl, or a pretty looking what the fuck is that thing? Mm-hmm. Yes. As we will learn in, uh, throughout these episodes. Yeah. And he's also the comic relief of the party. Nine times out of ten, if something silly happens, it's usually happening to Scanlan. Dick <laughs> Lightning. <laughs> he's not kidding, <laughs> folks! He is not fucking kidding! <laughs> we will explain later! Mm-hmm. But- Let's put... 
for those who are RVT followers, he is Varric. No, Matty, I will do you one better. He is a human form of Jean 9. <laughs> I, I retract my previous statement, Mike. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, that brings us to Travis's character, who in the campaign was one of the stars of the show because he stole the show every time he did something. The Goliath Barbarian, Grog Strongjaw! Beer! The funny thing he is, um, Goliath as a race is one of those things that had to be house-ruled in because in vanilla there isn't a Goliath race, and you really think there should have been? <laughs> yeah. But they make it work here. He is very strong. He is the, he is the muscle of the team. The only muscle that doesn't work is his brain. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that muscle does work because it's a muscle and not a brain. <laughs> to to quote Travis himself during the campaign, because I know they're never going to use this line in the series. I have an intelligence of six. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine where this leads. If, if, oh. if the funny shit's not happening to Scanlan, it's probably happening to Grog. I'd also like to point out. That, bro that that Grog is best friends with Pike. Like, they are the closest of close buddies, and he cries when she's not around. But... Yeah, he's a saucy. He's, he's, he's also pretty good friends with Scanlan. It's like he just like having friends shorter than him. Which is everybody, but these two especially. The shorter, the better for him. <laughs> he sounds kind of like us, Monk. <laughs> I I hate I hate that I can't dispute this. <laughs> right? no. We're the tall guys in our groups. So now I have to take a brief second before we get to the last character of our little of our little band of uh, crazies because there's a reason why we have to group Scanlan and Grog together. Throughout the airing of the show on Amazon, every week they would have a live Q&A thing over on Twitch the following Tuesday, where some of the cast would sit down and you could watch along by pulling up your Amazon Prime account and watch along with them and, and they'll answer questions. Well, during the last of these Q&A sessions, something happened that perked my eyes up the minute I saw a clip of this on YouTube, because, ladies and gentlemen, Grog and Scanlan walked into my territory! Walked in a lot of people's territory when you really think about it. True, but, you know, for the purposes of the parliament, they walked into my territory. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, we had Sam and Travis playing their characters as fucking VTubers. I am not fucking kidding. Which I'm pretty sure is under the category of things you didn't see coming. No, no way did I ever see them pulling this off. Mm -hmm. Like, they had that little bar section, and both of them had fully 3D avatars of their characters designed exactly like they are in the show, and they are moving around in them, acting out in character. Like, the only and, and the only thing is, is that Scanlan was sitting on a bent, uh, on a stool, and he could not get off of it because it's how the, you know, you can't, hard to move a VTuber avatar around. But yeah, they're just standing there, moving around, there's tracking and everything. It, it blew my fucking mind the minute I saw it. I was like, the fuck is going on? I was I was certain when I first saw the thumbnail, I'm like, this has to be fan mate. But then I watched it, I'm like, no. No, this is real. What the fuck? <laughs> I lost my So obviously they had some leftover budget it left over. <laughs> well, Eleven million dollars, probably plus probably some extra from Amazon. Yeah, I think it's safe to say they probably had some extra some extra cash lying around. <laughs> And with, I like to I like to describe Grog as the team teddy bear. Yes, he, he yes. absolutely is teddy because he's 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 a soft, cuddly, squishy soul. Bear because he'll rip your goddamn arms off if he wants to. <laughs> I I'll be I'll be honest with the VTuber thing. I didn't see it coming now, but I figured it was an inevitability because. It's a fad right now, and it's a very popular one. And 
they're professional voice actors. It kind of all just fits together. And I just didn't think like, it would be immediately. Yeah, we didn't think it'd be this quick. Like, you know, the fact that there's already voice actors becoming uh, VTubers. Hi there, uh, Kagi and uh, Amelie. How you doing? Amelie, <laughs> man, she's so good, too. Um, oh, she jumped right in. I, I still want to argue with her every time she's on her VTuber, be though, because, woman, you are not the master of the, of the multiverse. I ain't going to accept that. <laughs> Well, you'll, I'll, you can deal with that on your own time. Anyway, <laughs> we've, been dance, we've been dancing around it long enough. It's time to get to Talos and Jaffe's character, who, at least for this first season, becomes the principal character of the arc. And that would be Percival de Rolo. We're not going through his full name. <laughs> I was actually no! pulling it up. Oh, I wanted to say his full name, Monk. Fine. You know, you know what? Do it! Take oh, it! Oh, okay, okay, hold on. Oh, dude, you should have had it up and ready. I've got it right here. Oh, I already have it up right here, too. Percival Frederick Stein von Musel Kolosau Kolosowski. Excuse me, that one's weird. De Rolo the <laughs> Third. I can do it better. Percival Frederick Stein von Musel Kolosowski De Rolo the Third. There we go. And yes... You have to use that posh tone because that's how his character is. He is yeah. a man who... The, 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 most of the story comes from Percy in this first arc because he is a man who was used to be part of like the leadership of a certain town that we'll be getting to. However, his, his family was murdered and he was on the run. <laughs> and uh, as I'm talking, my wife just pulled up a clip from Critical Role from Campaign 2. And yes, hon, you should absolutely watch that. Anyway, I can hear the gears turning for anyone who hears displaced nobility. Yes. Also, also, a, um, shades. Aid a um a disp a displaced noble with fa with family back with family baggage. You getting deja vu? You should be. You have the strangest uh, yes. taste of Dijon mustard. Yes, yes. Good old fussy butt. <laughs> Little Lord Fussy Butt. Yeah, I, except... I had a dream the other day of, of me joining Critical Role as my old character, Ollie, the Whistler. <laughs> <laughs> no, but ba simply put, yeah. Uh, fortunately, I can't, I, can't be, I can't be a dick about it because uh, undoubtedly, they did it first. <laughs> also, oh, it's this... Not, it's not a case of dickery. It's just a case of amusing convergence. Fair enough. Speaking of convergence, converting things, this was the one character that Matt Matt had to homebrew, uh, cre create out of uh, from Pathfinder because yeah, Percy is a gunslinger. He uses guns and shoots things. Guns aren't really a thing in D and D. And depends you know, depends on the depends on the setting. Honestly, um, three point five tried to, but they failed. Yeah, but and we're the, using 5e for this one. But the way the way of the gunslinger fighter archetype that he made and you can and you can still get for free on D, on DM's guild um is in a lot is in a lot of ways a straight conversion of the gunslinger class from Pathfinder, even going down to having the grit mechanic. Pretty impressive when you think about it. But yeah, Mm -hmm. And th it's interesting how that plays, how this all ends up playing into the story for this first, for these first couple of arcs, especially the Bane arc of this season, which we'll be getting into shortly. Now, I know what a lot of you at home are probably thinking. Okay, well, all the other characters are accounted for, but uh, who's Matt playing? Well, he doesn't play all of the side characters. They they were not that stupid. But he does play a few additional voices, and in fact, there's actually a running gag that s there's someone that looks like Matthew Mercer in almost every episode. Spot the Mercer! Spot the Mercer! Which, in a weird way, kind of reminds me of Kuro Neko-sama from Trigun. Yes! Yes! <laughs> That's a it, perfect analogy I'm, right there. I'm gonna go even further. It's just Where's Waldo with extra steps. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, because you have to really. Sometimes, sometimes he stands out like a sore thumb. Like sometimes he's just right there in front of your face. Mm. <laughs> sometimes he is hiding in the crowd, and you gotta out hunt his ass. But he's there. They, there are videos that have been able to find him. <laughs> and sometimes he's a zombie. Aha! Uh-huh. <laughs> We're not kidding, folks. <laughs> so yeah, y- you can already see based on the the makeup of these characters how. <laughs> <laughs> She's watching that clip I mentioned. <laughs> anyway. But well, yeah. That a, that's a perfect was, interjection. Send us a DM. I'll want to watch what she watches later. Uh, I'll send it to you a little bit. Anyway, you can see based on the makeup of these characters how their very different personalities can lead to some interesting moments throughout the, throughout the series. Mm-hmm. Each of them has, a, has, a, has their own baggage, their own quirks, their own... Uh, particular conflicts with each other. There's internecine conflict rife with the Vox Machina. Oh, yeah. These guys are not all buddy-buddy singing Kumbaya and getting along every step away. They are times where these fuckers will butt heads. Constantly. I mean, yes. siblings on the same team? Definitely going to happen. <laughs> People of widely varying faiths and uh, ideologies bound to start happening. It's... People of widely worldly knowledge, a.k.a. Naive Key versus, you know, worldly Scanlan. Um, When it comes to this, when it comes to the siblings thing, let's let's not forget that it that we have that it's technically worse because they're twins. Yeah. Uh huh. Y'all thought your sibling. I thought my sibling rivalry with my sister when we were younger was bad. (laughs) Yeah. Now yeah, imagine you got two siblings who could literally kill each other. And the but this also helps to show why in the in the clutch when they do come together it's all the more impressive. Mm-hmm. They they have these some of them frankly asinine conflicts, the stupidest shit to fight about. But in the end they come together, they do what they can. They're the fucking Vox Machina. Yeah. They are Vox Machina, and they will fuck shit up. Now, Thank you, Scanlan. Get, getting, getting past the casting part, having having the um, have, having the having the fact that they end up t- that we we establish very quickly that th- that they're certainly not bad people, but they're certainly not going to be um, person of person of the year award nominees <laughs> which i think it i think is the i think is the more ideal way to do a to do a adventuring cl- a adventuring party even even i've done that with the whole idea of when they said when they asked for the best this is probably not what they had in mind <laughs> well the best already tried and they got their asses kicked <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> also we should take a brief moment to talk about the casting for this show because because of the fact that they had to kind of fill in the voices for uh, the re- for all the side characters that Matt had to play in the main campaign, of course. Again, like I said, you can't really have him do all of those voices again that would get kind of stupid. So, but because they had the budget they did, uh, they spared no expense for their casting. I mean, sure, you've got some, uh, easy, you know, they got Felicia Day because they worked with her on Geek and Sundry and they ended on good terms and they had a few guests they she worked with. She did an okay past. job in her role. By the way, she did pretty good. She did pretty good, but they also pulled in some big names. When you've got Dominic Mahan- Mahanigan and freaking David Tennant on your cast list, you've done something right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, they ain't kidding. Tenth fucking doctor played a pretty significant early role. Um, yeah, but, short as it might have been, uh, they got their yeah. money's worth, folks. But. However- like oh, okay. all of David Tennant's roles, except for the Tenth Doctor, you know what you're getting. Mm-hmm. As soon as you heard David Tennant, you should know what you're getting. <laughs> oh yeah, and the thing, but getting 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 into that's that's of course when you ha- when you have the whole thing of getting called up getting called up by somebody higher up on the food chain. In this ca- in this case, the ki- in this case the King of Amon. And 
the end, see, and the whole, I do think it was a smart move, because this is this is a, this is a trap that I see happen a lot, of refer of refer of referring to the monster that they that they'd have to deal with as the beast, instead of instead of what it actually is. We don't get it's not until it's not until much later in the episode that we actually get to see what it is. Which is a smart yeah. move to play off of, um, to 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 play off of the player knowledge and character knowledge problem. Yeah, nobody's supposed to know if the players nor anyone watching the campaign is supposed to know what they're fighting at, what they're looking for. You're supposed to figure that out. So, mm -hmm. and even when we see the the first party get slaughtered, you don't see anything that could clue you in as to what it is. Like, they do a very good job keeping this a secret until the last minute. Yeah. And of, and, of course, eventually it's revealed that what they're dealing with is a fucking blue dragon. And not yeah. just any blue dragon. This had to have been a, at least, if not yet ancient, at least an older one, because it was fucking gigantic. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It was a pretty big one. Also, another little bit of, of clever for, uh, storytelling and foreshadowing is Vex has an ability, has this kind of quirk to her that she can sense when dragons are nearby. If there's a dragon within within range, she suddenly starts getting a massive headache. Mm -hmm. And right away, while she's talking with the council, she's getting those headaches. And especially when she's looking at a uh, gray-skinned, seedy-looking motherfucker. Which I think I thought was a good I thought was a good um, red herring, because you look at that yeah. guy and you think this oh, guy yeah. this guy is untrustworthy as fuck. It's he's he's probably the traitor. Well, what's really <laughs> what's really funny is I remember I I forget if it was Maddie or Mace who said it. Uh, this guy he said something like this guy is is obviously evil, and I said no 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 evil coded. Yeah yeah you, you fucking called that. It shit. was Mace. Mace brought it up. Yeah, it was it was Mace. Okay, so Mace was all like, "This this guy is clearly an evil motherfucker," and I'm like, "No, no, no, evil coded," because I'm a genre savvy motherfucker. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but then again, they try to make it so obvious. They they try to make him look so obviously evil that you had to go. There's no way that it, it can't be that easy. You know, they could have pulled a double whammy though, and 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 made it that easy, and everybody would be like, "There's no way it's that easy," and then it was that easy. <laughs> yeah. Like either way they went, they could they could pull a surprise out of their ass. It's it's pretty good how they set that up. Mm. Yep. But, but yeah, the but the approach. But um, obviously with that, obviously within that, it you get you get the reveal of who's actually responsible. But one of my one of my favorite, I think one thing that we need that we need to um we need to cover because I thought this was a smart move is. A lot of t a lot of times, streaming services will release a whole season of a given work, in one in one big ass batch. With this, they did something smarter in releasing them in three episode batches over the span of four weeks. Yeah. Also made it nice and bite sized for us to consume every week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't have to binge watch it all in one night. We could take our time and enjoy it and kind of process everything and. Once we got back for the next set of episodes, we were ready to really see what happens next. Really well done. But the first arc with this blue dragon only takes the first two episodes, giving us a third one to really kind of set the tone for the rest of the season. What these first two episodes do is not only introduce the cast, kind of show what kind of party they are, not just in terms of how good they are at fighting, which right now they're not, and how comedic they how how little they could get along but also showing that when push comes to shove these guys can get shit done and the key moment is after they fight the blue dragon for the first time and he gets and he wipes the floor with them and they just barely survive on the way there they had passed by a town and they'd saw some kids playing and you know they were having some fun and kind of vax had given this kid uh, like a little memento a coin to as a as a memento Come yeah. back from this fight. I should note that he pulled the the old classic coin behind the ear trick. Yeah, light of hand, everything a rogue needs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
However, after that fight with the dragon, they come back, and this town has been completely wiped out. Everyone in the town killed. Lightning Breath will do that to a bitch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. And I'd like to note before you step forward, back when the dragon kicked their ass, even though uh, some of them still wanted to help people, most of Vox Machin was like, it's a fucking dragon. How can we stop it? Keyleth was terrified. Yeah. It is, she was scared shitless. Yeah. It is getting back to town <laughs> that is their, looking at the hero's journey, call to action. Go ahead, Shades. Yeah, no, actually, I was actually going on a similar path. Yeah, we're, if you're going by a hero's journey narrative, these first two episodes really cover that. As, yeah, you've got, you know, the, 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 you have the call to action, but you also have the refusal to, of the call. Mm-hmm. With them saying, fuck this, we're, we're not fighting a fucking dragon. Then They're not that dumb. No, but then they see what what ignoring this problem is going to lead to. And now they're like, fuck. This has to be stopped. Mm-hmm. Even Scanlan, who is by nature a fucking coward, um, is like, I guess we're going to have to kill a motherfucking dragon. He was, the fir- he was the first one to bring up the idea, as a matter of fact. Yeah. That kind of that really helps paint the picture of a party that yeah, they're 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 dysfunctional. They they have a, they can clash a lot. But when they're when they're motivated to do something as a group, get the fuck out of their way. Mm-hmm. Cuz they become unstoppable. And that's what this that's what the second episode really starts to show is that yeah, they'll goof around but once they finally come together and, and are motivated to work as a team to fight something together, there is not a force on Earth that can stop them. And with that, of course, and of course, the one would think that the reward would be a shit would be a shitload of gold, which they did end up getting because, well, it's a dragon. Dragons aren't always always have a hoard. Um, yeah, though they didn't get a chance to grab most of it. They only grabbed a, uh, a bit of it. <laughs> that's the problem with load-bearing villains. But one of my f- one of my favorite moments, and is uh, is something I'm pretty I'm something that I'm pretty sure was both funny and painful in the in the ca- in the campaign proper, is ev- is everybody trying to find these elaborate ways to open a locked door. <laughs> oh yes. Oh, they they use this as the preview clip for the show. Basically, yeah. Uh, while they were searching around for, to, they were looking into the general of of Taldore because you know they wanted to see what was going on, and as they're searching around, Grog and Scanlan are talking, and Grog and Scanlan's gonna run off, and Grog asks him to pick up a sandwich because he's you know, it's Grog, he's a hungry motherfucker. Mm-hmm. They're cut to the actual door where they're trying to break in, and you got Pike, Keyleth. And everybody else just trying their dandest to figure out, like, Scanlan even trying to use his magic to unlock the door. None of them can figure out how to do it. Here comes Vax, walks by, just casually grabs the, the toothpick with the olive off of the sandwich. Eats the olive because, you know, he's being a dick. Walks over, fills with the lock, click. <laughs> with all it the typical only takes a little swagger. finesse. <clears throat> Amateurs. Yep, all the typical, all the typical swagger of a rogue doing roguely things correctly. Mm-hmm. Yes, which and also course, makes some rogues insufferable. Yeah, but here they they walk that fine line and, and kind of make that the joke is that yeah he's being insufferable because he's like fucking amateurs. Of course, Grog over there, that was mine. Yep, but the other reason that they're investigating this this general's house was because they also saw Mister Coded Evil. Wicked man, uh, skulking about and doing stuff as well, and he eventually is in there too. <clears throat> this other counselor of Taldore. Yeah, which is why they investigate this place. But it turns out that that wasn't the motherfucker they should have been paying attention to, as they search inside the general's place and find a secret basement. Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's not cut to that chase they go inside the general's house and find uh mr i keep forgetting his name but i'm just gonna call him gray man because it, it works mr gray man 
Um, he's like, no, you don't understand. I need to come in here to get the evidence that the general's at fault. And then he gets shanked from behind by the general. Sheriff, and, and Vax is, is going, hey, nice. How'd you get that sneaky? Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <clears throat> it is at this point that I need to point out that Mr. General Guy is the man voiced by David Tennant. Yes! Why did no one pick up that he's the bad guy? David Tennant has played nothing but bad guys, excepting of the Doctor in, like, one other role. Let's not forget that one of his more noteworthy bad guy roles was as the Purple Man. Yeah. Oh, let's not forget that one of his more noteworthy bad guy roles, although it's highly comedic, is in Good Omens as a literal fucking demon! <laughs> because people are too trusting, they think, man. oh, he's, it's, it's the Doctor, he can't be evil. Let's the, not doc <laughs> the doctor is a dick too. Let's folks. not forget Let's he's also honest. the most the most insidious bad guy in Jessica Jones, and he also plays the creepy bad semi bad guy Bartimaeus Crouch Jr. Yeah, but people trust the doctor, I and mean, folks, even the doctor was a dick. Yeah, let's it be honest. His Tenet's doctor was not what. what let's, let us not forget that Tenet's run as the doctor gave us the Time Lord Victorious. Not just the Time Lord Victorious, but. Family of Blood. Oh yes, and what he did, to, and what he did to that. The you know when you know when people say there are worse things than death. The doctor proved it that day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in, in essence, you should have known the guy voiced by David Tennant was the bad guy. <laughs> but no, everybody's just like oh, it's the tenth Doctor. He can't do anything wrong. <laughs> David Tennant and thus must, the rug must was pulled that. over their eyes. Because, yes. Now, as they invest... Of course, they run away, find the secret basement where he's, he ran to. And right away, the show is basically trying to tell you what's up if you haven't already figured it out. I, I don't know. Dragon icons all over the basement. A tapestry of five dragons. Uh, all, the, all the pictures. Uh, I don't know what it could be. I think he might be a wizard. <laughs> No, 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 no. He, he, he's a shaman guy. He, he's definitely a shaman. Yeah, you're right. You're right. He's probably ah, some sort is. of shaman or druid. How did I no. miss it? Uh, thank you, Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. What they find is behind that lovely little portrait, the giant portrait hanging on the wall, is a portal to the dragon's cave where, yes, it is revealed that the general was actually the blue dragon in disguise. Using polymorph, which is why... She only sometimes got tiny tinge migraines. He did a decent job hiding it. In fact, if it wasn't for her tinges, he probably would have been able to stay hidden forever. So he would. So it's this is a literal case of, I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you meddling half elves. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and like, how, oh, and that mangy bear. How how young are they in in half elf years? Could we say that they were meddling kids? Probably. You know what? Let me check. Because I'm pretty sure it'll have their age on here. Uh, yeah. Uh, at this point, they're probably in their they're in their twenties. <laughs> yeah, they're children. In, uh, they're, they're literal elf kids. children. So it would have I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you meddling kids, especially Roar. compared to a dragon. <laughs> Roar! Thank you, Maddie. Oh, we need that, that mangy bear too. <laughs> but the uh the he literally turns into a giant fucking dragon in front of them by the way for those playing the home game yes that's david Tennant, aka the doctor is a fuck mothering dragon mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is where we get to finally see vox machina they, they take a little bit to get together but once they start coming together this is when we see them at their best because the teamwork that they do the back and forth you get to see that tagline I mentioned earlier. This is Vox Machina, and they are fucking shit up. Mm -hmm. You also get some iconic moments that fans of Critical Role would like, such as Grog's famous, I would like to <laughs> I love that. I, I remember when we were watching it, I called that. I'm like, he said the thing! <laughs> he said the thing! Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, of course... They actually had some really good, and I'm correct me if I'm wrong. These were actually things that happened in the battle, like the use of illusions and everything. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, it was really good that they got that sort of frenetic action that isn't always evident at the table. Um, sometimes combat can be um, a slog, especially for people who maybe don't understand their characters' features very well or don't understand all their spells and have to sometimes book hop. But getting that into an animated, you know, crunching it down into something animated is fantastic. And they do eventually end up destroying this load-bearing boss. Yeah, now before we go on to that, there's a, there is another case of adaptation changes, or name changes, because Scanland, one of his main abilities is, in the actual campaign, it's Bigby's hand. Mm -hmm. A giant magical hand that he can use to float around and punch things. Instead, he's... However, <laughs> however, once again, they can't call it Bigby's hand in the show. Licensing issues. So they just apt to they just opted to call it Scanlan's hand. <laughs> it's hand. <laughs> yeah, Scanlan's I know hand. I know I I know I developed a reputation of bitching about ev about every name about every stand name change in JoJo. At and the only but at the very least I'm willing to put up with the name changes here because of uh, because of the um li because of the licensing ish because of the more legit licensing issues whereas. Some of the name changes that I, that I saw in JoJo over the years were um, inconsistent. Didn't yeah. make any goddamn sense. No, here, even when they do change the names, they tried to and change it to something that keeps it in line, either with what it originally was or with the character it's based on. You know, again, changing Saren Ray to the Everlight. Well, she was the Everlight, so that makes sense. Changing Bigby's hand to Scanlan's hand. Well, it's still. Gives him the ability to scream it out in the musical sense, and it's it's his magic hand, so why not call it that? He's a magic bard with magic hands. Yeah. More was than one, ladies. Also, <laughs> that was also that was also my uh, my nod to the abridged community there. Hi, Takahata. Yeah. <laughs> I should note when when I when it comes to Scanlan's design, and I'll, I'll probably if I ever get if I ever get anybody involved with it, I'm gonna ask this. Was anybody listening to Prince when it came to envisioning him? Oh, yeah. I can see it. I can absolutely see it. I, it's, it's nothing outright obvious. It's just a hunch. And if someone's, if someone's looking at me going, you're only saying that because you're from Minnesota. Well, you're not wrong. I mean, all the purple and the fact that he's full of sexual energy. No, no, it's, it's outright... And nobody can say that it, there isn't some prince in there. Mm -hmm. Maybe more than one prince. <laughs> no, no, no. Fingerprints. No, thanks. Hi, everybody! <laughs> but the reward that they, the reward that they, that they get out of this not being gold, but in fact, a, in fact, a holding is something I wholeheartedly approve of because Lord knows D&D needed rules for holding because it's not in the fucking books. No, yep. I'm not letting that go. Yep, the the reward they get for killing the dragon is their own fucking keep. That and that and being t that and getting the title of defenders of Amon. It, I, I honestly think the way the keep was a way to tie them down so that they couldn't fucking escape. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be the defenders of Amon whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it definitely comes into play in the next arc. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Speaking of, I think we should get to the next arc because this and is where things start getting serious. Yeah, you you could you could look at the the first two episodes. You could look at as a bit of a pilot, and I'd, yeah. I'd imagine that if they didn't get as much money, we would have had just those two episodes, and that was it. Yeah, that makes sense. Honestly, I think that was what. Well, actually, no. Originally, what they were planning to do, from what I remember hearing, was they were actually going to adapt some of the stories from before the main campaigns on on, on Twitch. Like they were going to adapt some of their older stories. In fact, if you ever look at the uh, p potential intro they were plan they used for the Kickstarter, a lot of what they were showing was from earlier stuff pre camp pre uh, Twitch days mm -hmm. or pre Geek and Sundry days. So, but then once it became a full series, they realized they kind of needed to cover the main cam the main campaign because it'd be easier to adapt. 
It also gave them more than enough, you know, material. Exactly. So that ended up being what happened there. But in terms of like, if you were going to make a pilot, yeah, the terror of t- the two the two parts of the terror of Taldora would be a good way to sell it. But then we get to the second arc of this whole thing, the Briarwoods, mm-hmm. which now, gives us Matt Mercer's uh, main voiced role. Yes, Silas now, Briarwood. Yes. Now remember how I said earlier that Percy had a bit had his family killed. Well, we get to meet said killers in this in this next in this third episode. Yeah, and this is where this is of course where things start to get interesting. And I will I will admit I made some Xanatos jokes at it, at his expense because he looks like fucking Xanatos. He does. He totally does. <laughs> Except he's not the one making all the plans. I would say Lady Briarwood is the Xanatos in this situation, Mike. Yeah, Dahlia Briarwood is the one is the is the mastermind here. He, it, the, we, this is getting a little bit ahead, but we kind of learn near the end the backstory is that basically he he had that Silas Briarwood had contracted some kind of disease and he was pretty much on death's door. Mm-hmm. And in her desperation, she went out to a hidden library out in the woods and found a particular book. That allowed her to basically revive him, but not as a human. Mm-hmm. As now Silas Briar will, as she has become essentially a necromancer, and her husband has now become a vampire. Mm-hmm. A fuck mothering vampire at that. She's, yeah. she's, um, a, with the way that it all works, she's a necromancer by pact, so she's a necromancer warlock. Exactly, yeah. Considering the kind of spell she uses, that makes sense. Yeah, but and and the re- and there's actually a reason why they took over Percy's home of Whitestone, as we learned throughout the season. Yeah, but we'll get into that. And even though per- even though Percy is Percy and his and his past demons, um, that were har chosen. har. Yep, we'll get. To, I'll get to that. Were cho- were chosen. Were were the focus? Um, it does. That's not to say that uh, that others do, that others don't get don't get their own time in the spotlight. Yeah, yeah this is obviously when you're doing a D and D campaign, everyone needs to have their moments. You can't just focus on one main character. Main character syndrome is a real problem. Again, RPG horror stories. Look it up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You'll see how that always goes wrong. And but credit to the guys because because. Uh, Matt, Sam, and Travis were helping produce this show. They made damn sure that everyone got their time to shine, because in, right in the first outing, we see that the Briarwoods basically have an impact on a good chunk of the cast. You know, Silas is able to go toe to toe with Grog and basically is able to beat him down in the first in their first encounter, and Pike especially gets a big moment when. Uh, Delilah's magic basically can, at least as far as she's, as far as Pike knows, cuts off her connection to the Everlight. Not yeah. a, meaning she can no longer use her her healing magic. Mm-hmm. Any of her magic, really. Um, yeah, any of her magic. The 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 big thing here. Um, I just want to briefly mention our introduction to to uh, Silas and, <laughs> and, and Delilah is. Them being stopped by some bandits, one of which is the aforementioned Felicia Day, and Silas absolutely murking them. And then coming back into the carriage, wiping off his hand, as if he's just wiping off some dirt. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But the, 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 especially with the big impact to Pike, Pike then throws a a further impact on Keyleth, passing the torch, literally, by telling... Uh, telling Keyleth, you're their light now, because during this whole conflict where everybody's getting fucking destroyed, um, Keyleth is like, gotta create light, gotta create light, gotta create light, and creates light. <clears throat> and and that's that's a Chekhov's gun that we'll be getting back to later. But uh, the other the other thing with this is that like we talk about their introductions when. 
this all starts with a gathering of the leaders of Exandria gathering together for this big banquet to kind of talk business and try to unite everybody. And the course Vox Machina is invited because, well, they're the guardians of, Tal uh, of Tal'Dorei now. They, you know, need to be, you know, big deal. But as soon as the Briarwoods are introduced, Percy loses his shit. Which like, is... <laughs> the sweet irony of that is he was lecturing everybody on proper protocol. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Percy, and, up to this point, we I would say that in the two episodes we got prior to this, Percy was kind of muted. He was in the background a little bit. Um, he was still there, but more of a flavor than the actual main dish, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. Um, and the sense that you got from his introduction is he's usually very calm. He's good at controlling his emotions. He's good at trying to keep things within proper etiquette. Part of that probably stemming from his noble background. Um, so to see him absolutely unable to control himself... Going from from William Regal to the bride from Kill Bill. Yeah, he, um... It was a very large change of character. And it was the first big, uh, blinding red light in your eyes telling you, Hey, yeah, this is about Percy and, and the Briarwoods. And you're like, oh, I know where this is going. Yeah, the, yeah, right away you can see... And then we get to the end of the episode. Again, Vo Vox Machina, like, they try to sneak in and get more info on the Briarwoods because everyone can see that, okay, Percy is making a big fucking deal about this. There must be something going on. And Vax, Vax sneaks into their room trying to get some stuff and ends up stealing the book I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, of course, will piss Delilah off something fierce. But they go. They end up outside battling the Briarwoods. And I mentioned Pike getting getting her connection severed because it just she Delilah breaks her amulet that she was using to connect with the Everlight, and of course everyone else get their ass kicked. But after the Briarwoods make their 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 lovely escape, they leave their cart driver behind, and this is when we get to see the first instance of how far this has pushed Percy, because he decides to take his his anger out on this driver. And we get to see the first instance of him, pull, uh, of him really making use of his gun, pulling on, a, putting on a plague mask, and basically shooting this guy's hands off, nearly killing him. Not to mention his voice changing is because, because his voice actor decided to channel Crispin Freeman. <laughs> yes, yeah. he got deeper, colder, and very, very, very. Um, Aloof and threatening. Mm -hmm. um, Quite fitting for the nickname "No Mercy Percy," mind you, uh, my mind you. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is the first instance of "No Mercy Percy." So, that, of course, that's when you start to realize that's how, like, how far can you push a man before he snaps? Well, Percy's already been way past that point. Mm -hmm. Yep, but. Uh, while all this was occurring, and, and prior to this occurring, um, Silas used his vampiric powers to brainwash Amon and uh, say, no, no, no. You just you need to give more protection to Whitestone, and anybody who would fight against us is a, is a real threat that you need to take down. And so Amon, brainwashed, says, Fox Machina, you attacked the Briarwoods? You are now under house arrest. <laughs> And this, yeah. the, they get put into their keep, and it's at this point that Delilah's like, "Fuck, they have the book." Yep. So she tries to send some shadow wraiths after them to basically get it back. Mm -hmm. And this but, is the this this is the biggest moment where where things go real tits up. Yeah. Now it starts off pretty funny where the with the with the gang trying to get out of the castle, finding a secret exit. Only for the head of the guard to be waiting for them when they leave. <laughs> Hello. I mean, the keep, a... the keep was property of the city. I'm I'm not sure what Vox Machina was thinking that they wouldn't know about secret passages <laughs> built into the keep. Well, you never know. You never know what they've what, what they know about the place. They may not have known, but 
unfortunately for them, they did. <laughs> so now they've, now they've got all their weapons confiscated and everything else, so now they're royally fucked. And this becomes a problem when the wraiths show up, because they start slaughtering all the guards. Yep. And they nearly kill the captain himself, too. Um, the wraiths, when they attack people, do this wonderful thing, where suddenly black phlegm and black tears come out of your mouth and face and eyes. You basically start bleeding black blood from all your orifices. And it's <clears throat> not pretty. For, for me personally, the the whole the whole holdout in the keep with the wraiths. Um, I don't know. I don't know why. And maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I got a very Sam Raimi vibe. Uh, you're gonna have to elaborate on that one there. Mother. Evil Dead. Yeah. Um, ev Evil Dead, especially Evil Dead 2. I guess I could see it. And well, I, it, I, might, and it might be due to the fact that we had uh, that who, who wrote that particular episode. It's a name we actually know. Shoot. Ashley Birch. I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> She wrote a good one. <laughs> I honestly don't know how to feel about that. Um, I suppose an, another example I can use that when it comes to the Raimi comparisons is "Drag Me to Hell." Okay, yeah, yeah. I but, but that. I, I, I still the writer being Ashley Birch. I honestly don't know how to feel about that. Um, well, let it, sl well, let it slide. It's this is not the time or place to get into that. Oh, I know. I'm just my emotions are so confused, Monk. Um, However, and I, I'd like to I'd like to issue a correction to a statement I made earlier. This is the part where Keyleth actually creates the light. Mm -hmm. Yes, she creates a story. mini a mini sun in her hands. Literally a mini sun. It looks like a little sun, mm -hmm. um, which makes the almost wraiths... towards a hideout done. But hey, she got it going. Yep. Uh, it, it makes the wraiths tangible, so everybody can start picking them up and crushing them, which Grog immediately has fun doing with his. Because it's fucking yeah. Grog. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, the, and it's also the part where Pike says to the rest of the crew, I have to go find out why my cleric powers aren't working, so I'm leaving. Uh, and tells Keyleth, you're their light now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was the point where she did that. So yeah, small correction, but yes. this It's still a very huge impact, and it's still caused by the Briarwoods, because those Shadow Wraiths are direct... Or <laughs> direct action from Delilah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From there, the gang set up to go, you know, the guard finally is like, okay, you got your stuff, get out of here. If you're going to, you know, just don't let the others catch you because I can't help you after that. Yeah, he's like, he saved your, he, you saved my life. I think I could, if, if you guys are going to deal with this shit, go deal with it. You, you saved <laughs> my life and you're going to go take vengeance for my men. Remember, yeah. he's like, you're going to go kill whoever did this horrible thing to my men? And we're like, oh, he's not so concerned about the fact that somebody raised the dead. He's more concerned about the fact that these good men under his under his uh, command got slaughtered. Oh, good guard he, he captain. Has a right to be pissed. Now, we, there is a character we haven't had a chance to mention yet that we probably should bring up because they stopped by his shop at this point. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. A lovely man by the name of Sean Gilmore. Ah, uh, Gilmore, the most flamboyant wizard shopkeeper ever. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear him and Vax have a, th have a thing going. Like, I don't think that, not a full thing, but they, they flirt with each other the, the two times he shows up. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's not outright said that he 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 is is or is, or is not a thing but uh you would you would think they, they certainly fucking implied a lot there i mean oh, yeah. they fucking or have fucked before i mean i don't know i i had some guy friends when i was in in my teenagers where we would make jokes that were that pretty explicit i once had a buddy of mine literally come up to me. We're fully clothed in the middle of the hallway at high school. Wrap his legs around me and say, "Take me right here." 
<laughs> yeah, it was the best. I told I told him if I take you right here, I'll ruin you for the rest of your life. <laughs> it was it was a it was the best version of the chicken game ever, and uh, I won. Um, <laughs> but rails there uh yeah they probably have had something between them but even then they're still good friends good enough to just kind of flirt and throw them back and forth yeah and and gilmore has it works with vox machina at least a little bit i mean you 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 can tell that he's not exactly giving them like any big discounts or anything like that but you can tell he, he knows these guys need help and that he's willing to help them out he, he i wasn't the line uh for what he charged with his friends, I would hate to see what he gives his enemies. It, it's a bit, of, a bit of a minor spoiler, but near the end of the campaign, it's revealed that he didn't exactly give them that good of a discount act- at first. It wasn't until later he really started being nicer to them. Well, let's not let's not forget that um, he was willing to offer them a lance of dra- a lance of dragon slaying if they had like what, what was it, ten thousand gold or fourteen thousand gold. Yeah, if they had managed to get more gold from that dra- from that dragon sword, they probably would have been able to afford it. Yeah, the only problem is there's only one person who, there's only one person in the party who could probably wield that thing, and he would <laughs> wield it like a club. Yeah, he would. There's there's no way that uh no actually I could see him wielding it like a lance proper if you told him to shish kebab the dragon. Yeah, grog shish kebab it. Turn it into dragon shish kebab. <laughs> oh, that sounds yummy. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Only time he'd use the lance properly. Mm. But we digress. Gilmore uh, gives them some nice little tips and tricks and treats here and a bottle of holy water because they told him vampire. Vampires. The, the only thing that of note that they actually that he gives them that actually does come into play at some point are some fire ma- fire enchanted arrows. Yeah, and there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But but that it, the, after separating from Pike, they journey on for to find to head to Whitestone. And the theme for the next few episodes is things get worse. <laughs> oh yes, it starts off. When Delilah, wanting to get the book back, sends a bunch of hellhounds to basically get it back from them. Mm-hmm. And, oh boy, well, let me, another reason why you should not be watching with your kids. This shit gets gross. These guys do not, like, they use their animation budget to its fullest effect. You just see how grotesque and monstrous these hellhounds look. Somebody was playing Parasite Eve. Oh, yeah. fucking hell yeah. It, it, it is that level of ugh. They all say ugh. To me, it's more like, yeah, but that's just because I'm fucked up in the head. I was going to say. <laughs> uh, either that or they're weaklings. I don't know which it is anymore. Oh, no, I can handle it, but it's still a case of woof. Oh, boy. Maybe, maybe I should have taken that anatomy and physiology class in college all those years ago. I would have gotten to cut open a cadaver. That would have been cool. <laughs> the silence is palpable. <laughs> All I'm going to say is double tap. Double tap. <laughs> double goddamn tap. <laughs> but the the uh, the hellhounds are nigh unkillable in many cases. Yeah. And, it, and, and true to the fact, it takes a lot to kill these motherfuckers. Mm. Especially when they open, when the the hellhounds opening gambit is to basically grab Scanlan with its icky tongue and run with him. Mm-hmm. So now they're two party members down. Yep, Pike has already gone off to wherever she's going, and Scanlan is a hostage that they are chasing in a fucking horse-drawn cart. Ow. <laughs> I don't it's... know if I would say he. Oh yeah, he did like it. My Lady K just brought up the fact that at one point it goes full. Well, I've seen enough hentai to know where this is going. <laughs> oh yeah, some of those hellhounds grab her by the tongue, and one of those hellhounds gets gonorrhea. gonorrhea. Oh god, yeah, because yeah, what, the the hellhound that's got Scanlan takes his tongue and literally shoves it down his gullet, and suddenly Scanlan starts liking it. Yeah, that's that's Scanlan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's Scanlan. But. 
This chase is fraught with danger. Um, the, this is where the fire enchanted arrows come into play. Uh, a few of the hellhounds take some fire arrows and are the worse for it. Uh, yeah, Vex tries to use regular arrows to try to shoot uh, shoot the hellhound holding Scanlan, and it just she either misses or it just doesn't do anything. So finally, she's like, "Oh fuck it!" Boom. Which works on one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but to the one fair. that has Scanlan makes it to the edge. Makes it to a cliff edge, and that's when shit gets serious. So you have you it- have the you have the cliff edge. You have the death fake out. But even even when they manage to win, when he w- after the death fake out, they still lose because, well, the the bag with the bag with all the good with all the fire arrows, the holy water, and all the other goods ends up falling off a cliff. And the book they, uh, fell they, down they went over twenty five dollars on cliffhangers, folks. Yeah, and yeah, the book goes with it, and, and and this isn't a case of oh, well, we can go down there and get it. No, you hear the crash of the holy water. Yeah, um, the book is also down there, and. They think, oh, we could just take our time to get down there and get it. And then the Hellhound pulls up its front half and literally rips itself apart. Again, graphic. Uh, picks up the book and on two legs runs back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we should know. Yeah, the, the Hellhound found, fell on a freaking stalactite. Just shing. And yeah, that's how. And, and yet he was still able to rip his body off and bring the book back. That's. <laughs> well, I heard that. <laughs> I think we all did. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't think she... Yeah. So, yeah, again, this shit gets grotesque. But, inevitably, they find their way to Whitestone. And it, what I love here is the, is the setup and payoff with Percy. Percy, they ask Percy about what Whitestone is like. And he talks about this beautiful land with the majestic sun tree, the center of town. Beautiful, beautiful green, lush land. And then they arrive, and it is a desolate wasteland. The sun tree is, is barren and twisted. The ground is gray and black. The sky is, is a gray goddamn and black. dump. Uh, I think yeah. the best way to describe it is the way Percy describes it. It's a vi- it's a village in a, in Middle Earth. The way it actually looks like it's a village in Did- Warhammer. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. It, you, you go from the Shire to Detroit in, in, in RoboCop's universe. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, so, yeah. The, the biggest part is that not only is it, is it, does it look destitute, um, it is decaying, and it is overrun by the dead. Those, those giants were not, were not just giants. They were undead. <clears throat> now... In, be- in between them, on their way, uh, in the last, as they're making their last leg to Whitestone, and the, the Hellhound returns with the book. Right after that, there's a scene that sets up the, that's set up for the next episode, where a family comes in, and you don't, if for a brief moment, you don't realize what's gonna, ha- what they're doing there. Ah, uh, that scene. Oh, this was be so beautiful. Until like this little girl walks up to the lion and says, "Have we won a prize?" And, you know, because they're getting served dinner and everything like that before they get set up in their outfits. Which, why wouldn't you dress them before dinner? Well, turns out there's a reason. As we see Delilah hand the little girl a locket that looks very familiar. It's a it's a wooden effigy, and she hangs it around her neck of, well... Pike's amulet. Yeah. The next time we see this family... There are the seven of them, dressed as Vox Machina, hanging from the sun tree. And this is a scene that is absolutely ripped from the campaign, though it was slightly altered because it was a different party composition at that time. In fact, Trinket was with them. Mm Mm-hmm. But obviously, showing animal cruelty would have probably have gone a little too far, so they well, didn't. Go sensible there. in that. I mean, in that what in what that about the hellhounds? That's animal cruelty, even if they're undead. <laughs> when yeah, when it's some, double t- when monsters are involved, you can get you can get away with a lot more stuff. 
Yeah, but an actual bear, that probably would have gone too far for some people. So they made the wise yeah. call of just saying, making it the main crew. Yeah, I know. I'm just... Devil's advocate, Shades, I have to. Don't make me hit the fucking button. Don't. <laughs> but yeah, Keyleth, uh, Percy, and Ke Percy comes across the, 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 the effigies on the sun tree as they're walking through the town. As they search for a religious leader named Keeper Yemen. And at this time, we're also introduced to the fact that there is a rebellion against the Briarwoods. And this is where we meet our other big name voice actor, Archibald Desnay, voiced by Dominic Mahanigan. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know that name, uh, get Marriott. your brandy bucks out because we got we're getting merry up in here. Marriadoc brandy buck and peregrine took, specifically Marriadoc brandy buck, also known as Mary. Go watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy again, and then you'll know who we're talking about. And we don't mean the Amazon series. Fuck that shit. I said the what? Lord of the Rings trilogy, not this fucking whatever it is. Yeah, remember how we said earlier how Amazon really needed a win? I was kind of referring to that. <laughs> no, this is the loss after a win. Mm -hmm. they, they, they won with Vox Machina. This is coming out after. They're they're pissing away Just... all their good their their good their good uh. Goodwill. Fair enough. Fair enough. But still, you get my point. Yeah, Arch yeah. Ar Archibald Desnay, an old friend of of Percy's, who apparently got into a bit of shenanigans together as a kid, and he's leading the he's leading the rebel the rebellion against the Briarwoods. And uh, let's just say shit's not going very well for them. In fact, it is hitting multiple fans repeatedly yeah. because the first scene we see them in is one of one of the rebels. Arriving back to base, barely surviving, only for her to have led an entire troop of giant zombies right to them. Thus, most of the other rebels get killed in the room, and Archie gets captured. Like we said, the theme the theme for this uh, the theme for this section is things get worse. Yeah. So obviously, once once Percy and them meet with Keeper Yenin, she reveals this all this to them, and they have to set up a rescue mission to get him out. And we see Archie getting interrogated by a cup, uh, by a couple of people. Uh, it was Duke Vetemeyer and the actual jailer of the place, Carrion Stonefell, who. Well, his name his name is fairly apt. His name is fairly apt, but for whatever reason, even the just maybe it's just maybe it's just the whole um, the whole short bro the whole short broad sadist guy. I end up being reminded of Violator. You know, from Spawn. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's yeah, kind of yeah, got yeah, that yeah. look. He's kind of got that look just without you know. Without the clown part of it. Yeah, without the clown makeup. But it's got that short, ugly-looking motherfucker. Because mm -hmm. he is a... Uh, he's he's human, but he's also presumed to be a... Uh, Duger. Or... How do you pronounce that? He's an ugly fucking prick that you don't mind killing. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that I'm way. Gonna, but I'm going to post this in the Parliament channel. That's the other race that he's presumed to be. Wergar. Mm -hmm. Wergar. Thank you. So, yeah. So, they go through the rescue mission, and of course, there's not just Archibald there, there's also a lot of the other rebels in in, in the cells, so they free start freeing everybody. But, as they're making their escape, they run into Stonefell. And Percy has another one of his moments. I'd like to note that uh, we didn't mention a specific part of the last moment he had that becomes much more evident here. He puts on the mask, his voice changes to the threatening badass mode, and then he starts emitting black fucking smoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it becomes and a lot more obvious here. And there's another thing that's added to this scene. As we see on the barrel of his gun, 
the name of Carrion Stonefell on it. And it begins Almost to glow red. Almost like it's red. magically written there. Mm-hmm. Now, this is briefly explained later, but it's it's uh, it's only kind of explained in the show, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you what it tell you a little more about here. Percy's main gun in this in this arc is called is simply titled The List. Because on on 5 of the 6 barrels are the names of the people he seeks revenge on. Stonefell, Fedmeyer, uh uh, Anders, the professor that he grew up with, a woman by the name of Dr. Anna Ripley, and both of the Briarwoods. Mm-hmm. With the six barrel currently blank. So, needless to say, yeah, he goes into No Mercy Percy mode, shoots this guy to bits. And then and Doc and Stonefell's name suddenly vanishes from the list. Yep, yep. And actually, no, I think Duke Vedmeyer was not on the list. I, I, no. I gotta make a correction Vedmire there. Vedmeyer was not on the list. Vedmire was not no, on the list. Vedmire is not on the list. No. No, it was it was it was it was uh because Anders was the one that was on the list, not Vedmeyer. Yeah, mm-hmm. Stonefell, Anders, Ripley, and the Briarwoods. That's five. So they rescue Archie, and then Archie drops a bombshell. Because we've been hearing about some throughout the episode, we've been hearing about something called the Kestrel that they had had that they've been keeping uh, keeping contained in the cast in the main in the uh, town. Mm-hmm. Said Kestrel turns out to be Cassandra De Rolo, Percy's sister. The who sister closest saw, to him in age, in fact. Yeah, and who he had seen get shot in the back with multiple arrows. And by all accounts, she was dead. Like, you look at that and you're like, no, she's dead. But no, she just, they brought her back and somehow saved her. To use her as a hostage to basically help keep the people of Whitestone in check. Mm-hmm. But... Apparently that might have backfired because she's been feeding the rebels info throughout the entire time. So now, part two. We need to go rescue Cassandra. And eh. this re- this Sorry. does. I should note that this that this results in a few things. One, the introduction of a secondary weapon simply called bad news, which is still kind of a work in progress, mm-hmm. which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, and se- and second and secondly, a bet a better introduction to the to the resistance, including the yeah. including the including what would be Grog's motivation for fighting. There's no there's no more ale. <laughs> no, you do not get between Grog and his ale. No, no now. No, no. Uh, what would be a good word? Because I want to do no TV and no beer, no uh, make uh, Homer go crazy, you know, go something, something. But uh, what's a good equivalent for Grog, though? To ale, the cause of and the solution to all of life's problems. <laughs> Thank you. That that'll work. That'll very much work, sir. Now, while that is going on, we need to make sure we go back to a certain subplot. That we won't, that we won't, so we don't leave it behind because there's also the thing with Pike going on. Mm-hmm. Pike, of course, is help is gone to a church of the Everlight to basically help reestablish a connection. Mm-hmm. And this is carries over over the next. Let's see, we're on episode five. No, at least a couple six. episodes. Yeah, it goes. Yeah, it goes on to at least episode nine. I'd say. Mm-hmm. Of her yeah, it goes on to, to episode nine. Her trying to commune with the Everlight and constant, and essentially astral project into the into the Everlight's realm, and constantly getting blocked off. Yeah, but immediately the priest at the church realizes what the problem is. It's not a curse from Delilah. The problem with the Everlight is coming from Pike herself. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's a self doubt cycle.
And that will carry... And we might as well just go ahead and cover up, up through the most of this, because otherwise we're going to probably... Trying to go back and forth, we're going to forget something. Mm -hmm. This happens for a little while until finally, at some point, uh, just as the darkness is dragging her down, essentially, into hell, the Everlight finally appears before her and speaks to her. And what I really liked about this is that they could have easily gone sanctimonious right here. Mm-hmm. With her being forced to choose between her friends and her religion. But the Everlight basically takes her form and says, you can walk whatever path you want. As long as that path is in the name of the Everlight, you will have my light. And as long as you're true to yourself. Yes, that's the key. The, the big question is, who are you? Who are you truly? As long as you are true to yourself, you will have you will be walking the path of the Everlight. If you listen close, Thus, the Inquisitor is sneezing. <laughs> <laughs> and thus, that and we'll follow up on how that pays off in a couple episodes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, trust us, folks. There's a payoff. There is a very big payoff there. Thus, we get to the plan. We get to the rescue of Cassandra Dorolo. And this involves a two part, a part plan here because she's being held in this one in this one house, but it's completely flooded with guards. There ain't no way they're getting in without a distraction. So. They dis so Scanlan suggests and basically insists on going to Duke Vedmire's mansion and burning that shit to the ground. To the point where he basically argues with Vex until he's like, you know what? I'm Scanlan Shorehall. My big thing is that I annoy that I am annoying as fuck. So you know what? Let me be annoying as fuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, earlier on, I think this was something he picked up from the Dragon's Horde as they had gotten a couple of potions they didn't know what to do with, and a scroll. He had tried using the scroll earlier on during this fun little uh, campfire scene where they were sharing stories, which, by the way, once again, another one of those Scanlan scenes shows up. <laughs> hey, he's, <laughs> st he's still finished. <laughs> when you, I, I won't spoil that one, folks, but when you see it, you'll understand why that's so fucking Man! funny. Your bard. <laughs> anyway, so he tried using the scroll earlier during that scene, and he couldn't quite control it. Like he just kept turning into random shit. So he tries to sneak into the mansion, but the window he ends up walk sneaking into just happens to be the bathroom with the Duke, middle of du of uh, dropping the kids off at the pool. <laughs> The Duke in the middle of a deuce. <laughs> Thank yes. you. No, 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 no. Yes. The Duke in, in the middle of a dookie. Yes. And they, they even show him standing up as the last bit drops in. Thanks for that, show. Thanks. You really <laughs> needed to see that. Needless to say, he's busted and he's on the run trying to get away from the guards. He gets into one room where he's locked in and he decides, screw it, what have I got in here? Which, once again, another Scanlan moment as he pulls out a pair, a set of beads. Yes, he, those kind of beads. He said, he said, it's fun, but not right now, when he pulled them out. Too. Yeah, he's like, Woo! fun, but not right now. Finally, he pulls out the scroll, and he's like, you know, I, I can't get this thing to work every time I read it. What if I were to sing it? So by singing the incantation, motherfucker turns into a Triceratops! And it, starts ramming his way through the guards. Yeah. Which it should works. be noted at, at this point that he has already technically set the building on fire. So he achieved yeah. his goal. Yeah, he, he'd, he'd used, he used the other potions. One of them gave him temporary teleportation. The second one shrunk him. And then the third, and then as he gets grabbed, just before he gets grabbed by the guards, he, he drinks the third one and it's fire breath. Mm -hmm. So he's basically just puking up flames all over the place, almost literally. And so the fire starts. That's when he turns to the Triceratops and starts running around, taking shots from a whole bunch of spear or arrows being shot at him. And I'm, and I'm very... We, Go ahead. We, we almost forgot to bring up one very important thing. 
We forgot to mention the greatest enemy of Vox Machina. Oh, no. We hinted at this earlier, but now we're going to have to call it here. The greatest enemy of Vox Machina. Doors! The bane of every adventuring party. Yup. There's at least three instances of it. We've already mentioned one with the locked door of the general in the first arc. During the uh, jail breakout, the, uh, Vax tried to uh, use his lock picking seals on another door, and it just did not work. This guy was rolling low ro rolls that day. Mm -hmm. Poor Liam. And now here, as Scanlan is charging down a hallway, he tries to ram through this door, and just as he's about to hit it, the, the spell wears off, and he just flies into it head first in his normal form. Mm -hmm. And this is when we get to what I'm sure Zan over here has been waiting for. We climb up to the roof of this house, this this mansion that the Duke is, is owning, and Scanlan's looking for a way out, because the place is on fire now. He's kind of gotten away from most people. Um, the Duke is following him up, though. The, like he he doesn't understand why this <clears throat> to to quote another really good scene why won't you die <clears throat> also or orphes.com let's let's go Sean Bean why don't you be a good bard and die also there's a little bit of prejudice here because in in a sense because he keeps referring to Scanlan's sh being short and weak when you're short you lose. Yep. And then he's got Scanlan pinned on the ground. He's about to cut off his his head, the one he thinks with. No, the other one. <laughs> and uh, this is when we pull the biggest bard move he could, Scanlan's Dick Lightning. Yeah. He had tried using his lightning spell earlier, but it was pretty weak both, both times he had tried to use it before. But when he shoots it from his dick, it's a fucking lightning storm coming out of his I'm head. a fire laser kind of yeah. dick. Yeah. Oh, wow. Laser collection reference. That's not topical. <laughs> Whoever said we were topical? I'm buddy. Precious. I know we you are, speak. and I'm making a we joke are, myself. We are, inter we are geeks on the internet. For God's sakes, it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but the... the this is the epitome of, Scan of Scanlan taking all of his stereotypes and literally fucking them into somebody else. <laughs> hey, hey, the dick was attached to the lightning. The lightning was attached to the man. He's fucking that man, literally, with lightning. Okay, okay Lady K just made the joke of the night because, yeah, Duke Venmire literally rode the lightning. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> See? Thank you, Lady K. You've you 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 completed the joke for me. And approved. Awesome. <laughs> but uh, but then after all that, Scanlan runs away on Scanlan's hand as far as he can, which also causes him because he's beat has the shit beat out of him and he's exhausted. He floats away on his hand until it flickers out from underneath him and he drops. Oh, Zan, Zan, Zan! You're forgetting the best part of that. Because what was Scanlan's hand doing as he rode off on it? A giant middle finger. He was flipping him the big old bird, literally. Yep. He flew away You're on the bird. You're a good audience, and that's the bottom line. Oh, wait, wait, wrong, wrong Scanlan. <laughs> <laughs> wrong so, show. Yeah. Now, of course, as this is going on, of course, now that means that you know the distraction is caused, the guards are distracted, and thus the rest of the party is able to sneak in get in now vax being smart tries to check the door for traps because of course you're gonna have traps here but Frog Frog is like, oh, come on not all of them's got traps bust down the door there's a whole crew of guards with arrows pointed right at him it's a trap, it's a trap. <laughs> shink, 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 shink. of course no, Frog, no, no. Did, Frog, Frog did Frog did uh kurt russell's character from uh from uh, Big Little Big Trouble Little China. All right, on three. One, two, three. Opens the door, bunch of guards. We may be trapped. <laughs> he takes the shots and goes off. And of course, you, as the others help clear a path, Percy gets up to the top, or gets up at to the top upper floor, 
where he sees Professor Anders run away into a room, and he looks inside to see her, see him ba- uh, grappling with Cassandra. Dun, 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 dun. And he gets in just in time for Cassandra to get held up with a knife. Mm-hmm. This leads us into our next episode where shit starts getting real bad. Because they run in. You know, at the, uh, he, he goes on. He goes to fight Anders. And Cassandra, he, uh, it actually starts with Anders. Slicing her throat wide open. And Percy screaming at Keyleth to help her. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, Pike's not there. Keyleth's the only one who could. Yep. But I mean, like, he's shouting. This is this is a Percy you don't normally see. This is a case of, Anders just pushed the Percy button. Shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. But, credit to Anders, he puts up a hell of a fight. Not on his own, though. You know how we talked about how... Scanlan has a silver tongue. Anders literally has a silver tongue. And he can use it to manipulate objects. He, in fact, activates a few uh, suits of magical armor with it. Basically turning them into armored golems. Mm. And they fight for a little while. Of course, eventually the others start catching up and helping out in the fray. Until Until it's discovered that, oh... Just hit the just hit the inside the leather straps on the inside. Those things will fall apart like nothing. At which point Anders then goes, "Oh, I realize that your barbarian friend is stupid enough. Kill Vox Machina." And Grog, sweet, dumb, lovable Grog, is now the threat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And before long, after having to fight with them for a while. Anders finally just has enough. He's like, enough of this shit. And then does the same to everyone but Percy. He's like, watch as you get killed by all your friends. And pins, gets Percy pinned to the wall. And Percy, biting for time, is like, you know, you're, you, you were right about us being intelligent. We have to know all the angles. Yes. Now, we should also mention that we also learn a little bit about the history of, Sto- of Whitestone and what this was about. Why Anders turned on them, because he was their teacher. Mm -hmm. But what he really wanted to do is he wanted to help in the the refining of the town's main uh, resource, Residuum. It was a magical stone that basically could amplify the magic of anything close to it. Yeah, it's a magical stone. And it was also part of something kind of created as a byproduct from the sun tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, of course, the, 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 the Dorolos didn't really care for that. They didn't really need more of it. They were doing fine with what they had. They didn't need to refine anything. So they, they just wanted him to teach Percy and Cassandra to be ready to take over as the leaders of Whitestone. Now, something I do want to point out. In the memory flashbacks we get from these villains, the Dorolos are painted... The, the attitudes that they give are... Like a the typical what you would think a noble to their to their servant, mm-hmm. they're a little aloof, a little uh, condescending, but it, it it isn't. It's almost not malicious when you take it all in context. They're like, we've talked about this, Anders. We don't need to refine any more residuum. And I, I think that the the flashback is colored by Anders because the flashbacks we get from Percy also obviously being covered by colored by Percy uh, don't show that type of condescension. I, I imagine that the Dorolos were probably fairly normal. Um, and they knew how to properly reward their people because Whitestone prior to the Briarwoods was considered a very good place to live for everyone. Everybody liked it. Yeah. It was Um, was a well, well known place. So the the sort of condescending tones they were given in Anders' version of the flashback only almost makes me think that it, that the whole flashback is colored from Anders' perspective. Oh, absolutely. You, you know it was. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that's I, I bring that up because that's what uh, Percy is trying to do to appeal to Anders to buy time. He's, he's basically like, yeah, 
You know, you're right. We should have listened to you. We should have worked with you on this. You know, we're smart, we're smart people. We can make this so We just got to find the right angle to things. But of course, that's not what Percy was actually talking about. Percy because... was literally knowing all the angles. And He's a sharpshooter. Yeah. With, with the last of his ability to act before his own friends tore him apart, tried to tear him apart, he bounced one of the shots from his pepper box off of multiple objects in the room and blows out Anders' lower jaw and tongue. Which is... Lit- is- <laughs> which <laughs> um, deci- which and again- decides to... Once again, once again, give me Evil Dead flashbacks because it decides to start skittering off. Yeah, but that thing's alive. This this is another one of those moments where I'm sure Shades would tell you, don't watch with your kids. It's really graphic. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the tongue being on the ground me, is boys. A, little cre- a little gross, but not that bad. But yeah, the shot of the jaw getting blown off. Woo-hoo! Looks like any shot of the jaw of the of a jaw getting blown off by a gun that I've ever seen on places like. Uh, oh yeah, it's uh, it's done really well, but that's raw, my point. It's done gun. really well. <laughs> it's like places of of, of sh- now shut down websites that had actual gore. Oh, uh, that's yeah. <laughs> I've seen but, a couple of those. I'd rather not. <laughs> the uh, yeah. the tongue has a mind of its own, literally. Um. And so while Percy is now, his friends are released from the spell. They're like, whoa, uh, Percy is now black mask on, slowly approaching Anders. Uh, while the entire, uh, uh, like for, for comedic effect, almost to give you this discord in the, in the whole picture, um, the rest of Vox Machina is chasing around the tongue to try and catch it. And uh, then, of course, Percy, no mercy Percy. Well... That's another name on the list. Yep. Whenever he sees somebody who's on the list, it takes the, you start to see this thing going down. Yep. And so and- Anders is is name number two off the list. Um, I think it's right at the same. This- <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, wasn't it the same time? Uh, who who was it that stabbed the tongue at that point? I. Th- want to say that was I want to say that was Vax mm-hmm. mm. and so as as Percy is killing one of his nemeses Vax is killing the silver tongue I could be wrong on that one I'll have to double check that but regardless also while all of this is going on while the fight was going on Keyleth did, resur- uh, did manage to save uh, Cassandra with a funny little moment where it looks like she didn't make it in time, and Cassandra just kind of slumps over, and then all of a sudden, ah! she rises up, and they both freak out, and, and, and Cassandra passes out from the shock. Yeah, but she's alive and breathing, even with blood down her front. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, at that point, Percy is infinitely grateful, at least for that moment. Yeah. Now, of course. The the resist uh, Archie and Ball had told them to send a signal up to let them know that they had gotten Cassandra, so they could really start rallying the troops. And that's where Keyleth decides to show off a little bit, using her uh, using her magic to basically cause the clouds to form into the Dorolo crest in the sky. Which, of course, clue- <laughs> it of course clues in the bad guys too. Because, of course it does. They can see the sky just as well. Yeah, you, you've immediately tipped off Delilah that, yeah, uh, their shit's falling apart now. And, and I love how, throughout the whole thing, Silas is like, I need to be down there on the front lines. No, darling, you need to stay back. We've got this. <laughs> and, of course... Because she, she, she's out of sex. You don't want to lose your hubby. This is fair. So she heads down into the basement, calls forth one of her servants, slices his neck, and uses him for her next ritual. And what does that ritual do? Ladies and gentlemen, we got zombies. So all of the you know zombies. How, you know how I've been making Sam Raimi jokes? Earlier I brought up Evil Dead 2. Now we're in full on Army of Darkness mode. <laughs> yep. With Percy with the boomstick. Yes. So, Percy of course- Percy actually designed a new boomstick which we're going to get to soon. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, Monk already brought up bad news. But mm -hmm. basically, yeah. Uh, Scanlan is the first one to discover this as he's heading back from the from Vedmire's place. Sees what he thinks is a couple making out in a dark alleyway. Goes to take a closer look, and uh, it's a zombie eating the guy alive. Oh, shit. <laughs> so Scanlan is now running towards the rest of Vox, and Vox is, well, kind of celebrating what they've done. And... We play. We get to play the the out of breath noun game. Mm -hmm. And of course, he, he starts saying he's trying to say horde, but of course he can't get that d out of on, on his on his heavy breath, so he just says whore. And Dex is like, we don't want to hear about your host your stories again, Scanlan. It's like no, a horde of zombies. Oh shit! <laughs> I believe the technical term is pants to be darkened. Oh and, yeah. Hey, you up? When we're talking horde, we we are going with, we are going with this isn't enough this isn't enough where you could where you could just rain down a few arrows. No, you no you'd need to car you need a carpet bound the place to get to get this many out. We're dealing with Raccoon City shit. Dead rising, they ladies and gentlemen. Dead goddamn rising. There, yeah. There's a there's a, a theory. I forget who says it exactly, but it went. But one of Vox Machina says. Did she raise the dead of the entire city? Yeah, that's a little foreshadowing for later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, but of course, with, that... with with all of the dead raising, that there is one there is one question that's never that's never really answered. What's with the giants? <laughs> I think th those were some because we saw those before that point. I think those were something she could, probably some kind of abomination she conjured up to guard this to watch over the city probably probably at probably taking probably taking a few dozen dead to create it to create something bigger yeah and of course uh q come up with your own attack on titan joke for that one especially mm -hmm. when he braids when they raid the uh resistance base like yeah. that's it was an attack on titan moment when one of them picks up one of the resistance numbers and literally just eats them mm -hmm. but this leads us to the all hope seems lost moment. The moment where it looks like they are fucked. Regroup because they, regrouping at the sun tree. Um, well, it got everybody together, but didn't exactly thin out the numbers. Yeah, they're surrounded by the zombies. They try to rally the troops. They put up a damn, a pretty valiant fight as best they can. And, and then all of a sudden, big fucking. Are we there? Are we there? No. Not no, there we're yet. not there yet. We're not there yet. Uh, we do get a couple awesome moments, like uh, no, oh, actually no. At this point, it hadn't happened yet because Scanlan had gotten bitten at one point. Yep, Scanlan's and gotten bitten, so his arm is going necrotic. Um, they're all at the sun tree. Everybody is coming in. All the all the zombies, all the giants. They're fighting. They're fighting. But uh, it's looking bad, and to the point where Vax looks at Bercy, it was like, it's not a fighting with you, friend. Now, Maddie, you can say. All of a sudden, big freaking flash of light. And a small being starts killing zombies all the lands, and it's all kind of epic. It, it's, 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 it's Pike. Sup? So so, yeah, she, literally this glowing being just shows, appears on the battlefield, wipes out a good chunk of the zombies, stands up. And just as she starts to turn, you see it's Pike, and she's just like, "Sup?" <laughs> and then, of course, <laughs> Scanlan, being Scanlan, oh my God, marry me! Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we get a couple of those moments with those two. The best part of the the, the, the best part of the marry me line was the, was the response. Sure, right now. What? What? <laughs> she she got scan she caught Scanlan off guard. Actually, something that was kind of, like, when I saw that scene, I'm like, they both mean it. It, it wasn't was a joke from either side. They, play, <laughs> they played it off like a joke, but it wasn't a joke from either side. <laughs> That's just the way that scene felt. <laughs> yeah. But... But regardless, she helps. She heals his hand up because she's a holy person. Necrotic things are something she's good at healing up. And that's when the fight starts picking up speed, where they just start kicking everybody's ass. And we we get what I'm like to call the reverse fastball special. 
where most people, you know the fastball special. Big guy takes a little guy, tosses him, across, tosses him down for a big attack. Well, this time, Scanlan takes Scanlan's hand and uses it to launch Grog. At a giant. At so that Grog... Giants. So that Grog can do his best impression of a lumberjack splitting logs. <laughs> I believe I believe the term I use for this kind of thing is long division. Oh, indeed it was. I, I could make another reference, but you all would moan and want to kill me. Oh? I mean it's a zombie attack. This is this is appropriate, both the moaning and the killing. Go ahead. <laughs> Fair. No, but this would not be the good kind of moaning or anything like that, because it's a uh it's a mo it's a reference to a bad scene. Go ahead. Operation Overdrive. Ah! Oh, ah! yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I know what I you mean. I don't even have to tell you what I'm referring to. You know. All you know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. All that, all that I will say is, um, everybody, go watch our reconstruction of Operation Overdrive. You'll thank us later. Ding! Cheap plug. <laughs> cheap plug? It's not, it's not cheap, it's free. We're not charging anybody cheap yet. Cheap plug. Cheap plug. Cheap ass plug. Cheap ass but, plug. Cheap ass but, plug. Uh, I, I, I think the best part is that uh, Vax is also killing a giant at this point. And yeah, Vax has... Is not... Hold on, let's set that scene as well. <sighs> Vax shoots a couple arrows to help guide him up. And he starts ch he just starts stabbing away at it until eventually he takes both of his daggers and right in the eyes. Yep. And Vax's Vax's giant goes down first. But Grog is like Grog is trying to argue that he was first. Again, these guys don't get along all the time. Even when in the midst of a fight like this, they have to bicker. I mean, it's more Gimli, Gimli and, and oh, Legolas. Oh, it's absolutely, it's absolutely Gimli and Legolas. That still this, only counts as one. <laughs> except this time, Gimli isn't shorter than his opponent. Yes. <laughs> also, there's a scene. I, I know there's a scene early in the in, in, in their keep where you know Vax Vax says uh, he's he's eating his Vax. breakfast. No, no, no. And Grog. Grog is eating his breakfast. He's sitting down. Vax has got a, he's got bread. He's about to sit down. Ping! Ball Grog, tag. Grog, Grog oh, Raxton. Yeah, we forgot to bring up the ball tag! Yeah. <laughs> but, no, what's really funny is when Vax does finally get Grog back, uh, he gets three points for how good it was. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's the type of friendship Vax and Grog have. Yeah. Which is why the giant scene is even funnier. Exactly. Eventually, <laughs> eventually, though, Pike decides to do uh, her disco glowball special where she floats into the air and imbues everybody's weapons with holy light. And I mean everybody's. Every commoner, every person there. Even the baby will... You don't just be swords even the baby. and daggers. You're seeing pitchforks and shovels glowing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, wheat scythes and pickaxes. Also, I will be right back. No worries. But as the as every, as as one might ex this is this is our turning the tide moment, and I I do appre I this is one of the this is one of those things that if it, if this was this is why I'm so why I'm so glad that I never run Adventurers League or RP RPGA. In fact, um, I kind of the last time I the last time I was involved with RPGA, I um, kind of got myself in trouble. Yeah, -oh. yeah, <laughs> see that. <laughs> um, large, largely because rules lawyers and I don't mix. One would think I'd get along with rules lawyers. I don't. <laughs> Why would anyone get along with rules lawyers? Because rules lawyers are may as well be rules Nazis. You're not, f sadly, Maddie. You're not far off. And in this in this particular case, I um, I just I decided to I just I guess the best way from the best way for me to put it is, Maddie, are you are you familiar with the the fact that there was a certain coach who. Made the N made the NHL come up with a better rule book by constantly trolling them. 
Oh, I'm trying. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm. I can't think of the name right now, though. Um, Secret Base did a video on him a, f a few years back. Basically, basically, he would find new and interesting ways to mess with the rules to try and get because there wasn't rules against them. Like, I think, in, I think, in one point, he tried, he tried to have, he tried to field a team of nothing but goal with nothing but goaltending, and the NHL was like, no, and he was like, yeah, but there's no, there's no rule against it. The only rule is that I have to have five men on the on the ice. You didn't say what position they. Have. You didn't say what position they have to be. So I'm having them all goalies. I'm having five go. I'm having. I'm having a wall of goalies in, in the thing. And you better come up with a new rule, or you can't stop me. I was that. I was send me that, that video. I need to watch that now. All right, I'm, I'm back. Um, just as a final note with that, Maddie, he did. Um, he did. Tr he did try and build. He did try and build a snowman until the league got mad at him. <laughs> but I was I was that guy I was that guy who I I wouldn't break any of the rules but I would bend the interpretation in ways that would mess with anybody who has OCD. Oh, That's what Jesus. got me in trouble. All right, so where where are we left off at? Um, it it was the turning of the tide moment with Pike. Okay, so we're still and off that. What I what I was pointing out is that um. These are the these are the kind of things that any good GM is going to be how is going to be house ruling. Largely, largely because if you were to do raw rules as written, a lot of the stuff that she's doing in this scene you couldn't pull off. I'd let you pull yeah. it off, but but that's but that's because I understand the value of rule zero. And so does Matt Mercer in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 I, uh, there's always been like again, this is another thing I've seen a lot in RPG horror stories: are rules police. Oh yeah. People who insist, yeah, you you've dealt with these kind of people, I'm sure. People who insist that the rules are the rules and you have to stick to them like glue. <laughs> like that's you, what have, got you have that's what got me kicked out of the RPGA. <laughs> that was the story I was tell I was telling them earlier about how I managed to annoy a rules lawyer to me getting thrown out. Yeah. That that kind of shit is, you know, but a good TRPG is one where you can bend the rules for the sake of you uh, know, entertain for the sake of the fun of the game. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it's most people, most good DMs will tell you the DM is the actual rules lawyer. They'll decide whether or not the rules apply in a case like that. There's a concept that I that I hinted at called Rule Zero, which I believe every GM needs to have ingrained in them. There's multiple ways that Rule Zero is written, but the most common way, the most common way is this: the rules here in the book are presented for entertainment. If the if a rule is getting in the way of the fun, the fun takes priority. Yeah. And that's the that's the reason why people who, why people who are straight are straight up raws will not will always be disliked in some manner. Yeah, because that leaves the game boring as shit if they can't do all the fun stuff they want to do. Obviously, mm -hmm. you have to put some limitations. You know, depending on the situation, you know, if there's a case where a check might be a better idea because it, you know, adds a little challenge and creates a possibility that it might not work, mm. fine. But if you're in a moment like this where you're you you can imbue the you know imbuing the entire cr town with with holy weapons would create a fun little narrative, even though technically she shouldn't be able to do it. it, it also, bear in mind she's currently right now on god mode because she's astral projecting her power. And she's like tapped in the most power she's ever had, mm -hmm. so you could easily justify her being able to share a little bit of that. Basically, Luke Skywalker episode eight done right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you know, you know. Yeah, that's the kind of thing you can get away with, and and that's something that, again, a good DM, which Matt clearly is, would allow to happen in a situation like this. Plus, even if, if this is something they change just for the show, it still does the fucking job. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a cool little moment right there. Also, uh, considering what I just had to take care of, we forgot another fun moment that uh, connects with the whole doors thing. Because during the jailbreak, when I said Vax couldn't lockpick the door, do you want to remember? Do you remember how they got in? The guard oh. opened the door to throw out a chamber pot and hit them all with a pot full of piss. Oh. <laughs> uh. And the moment when they when they meet up and Vex is Vex is happy to see them is like oh it took you guys long enough how do you smell like piss? 
Anyway. <laughs> that, that's right there. I think the reason, the, fa the fact that we're jumping back and forth, we're remembering shit that we forgot to talk about, shows you how much is crammed into these 12 episodes. There's just so much stuff that trying to break it down is, like, difficult as shit because there's just so much. Yeah. But... This is this is as good as in, this is as good a point as any to to lead to lead into what's effectively the final act. Yeah, these last few episodes are Act Three, the mm -hmm. the the final battle to come. And good getting into getting into the getting into the obviously the empo the empowered um, resistance fighters is meant is meant to be the main attack and diversion. Because rem remember, the diversion that you're ignoring is the main attack. Yep. That's what that is one of the rules of combat they don't teach you. <laughs> so basically, they head to Castle Whitestone, and of course, because Percy used to live there, he knows where all the secret entrances are. Mm -hmm. Again, cut back to the keep at Amon. So they get sneak into the into the dungeons, and they find a woman in one of the cells. Who's missing an arm? Now, of course, everyone else is like, oh, another prisoner. We gotta free her. She gotta help us out. Percy goes no mercy, Percy, immediately. Dun, 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 dun. Because, yeah, and that makes it very clear, considering it's not the Briarwoods, that the, and he only goes like this when it's someone on the list. It only leaves one name that we hadn't met yet. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ripley, I presume. I understood that reference. <laughs> I figured you would. But yeah, it's Dr. Anna Ripley. And we quickly see why she's on the list. Is Apparently, after when Percy and Cassandra were captured and the rest of the family was killed off, they tried to torture Percy to reveal the location of a certain secret location underneath Whitestone. But he probably did not know there was any other secrets in Whitestone. So, didn't have the answer. Well, Ripley didn't like that all too well. So, she ended up torturing his ass, literally driving a hook right through his chest. But she didn't drag it through it. his chest, she dragged it across. across. It. Mm -hmm. yeah. Drag it, that's what I meant. Dragged it across his chest. And then even threatened, Cass and threatened to harm Cassandra in the process. But what they were looking for, this is something that has been brought up already, so I can reveal this now. Underneath Whitestone, there's an ancient ziggurat. Or if you're and scaling this... a zipper twat or a zigger wad, or you, <laughs> yeah. you get the idea. Well, to be fair, he was reading a book in a very, a very different language that he cannot read, so he was struggling mm -hmm. to translate it. But this is when we start to learn the truth behind what's going on here, because. What the, the 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 thing this is all leading up to is a creature that they that the Briarwoods have basically been serving, the true spirit behind that book. In the show, they are simply referred to as the Whispered One. However, this is once again where we have to bring up name changes because this was another name that was li not licensable. Because the real name of the Whispered One is Vecna. Motherfucking Vecna, the lich that won't stay dead. I mean, <laughs> Lord Monk, knows that, people have tried. Monk, that's that's the point. Liches don't stay dead. Yeah, some. He has been he has been a notorious pain in the ass to to players to players the world over for the past forty years, going all the going all the way back to, it's to um the, to the A D and D days. Some, some, those of you who spend more time with video games may remember that Vecna's head was a com, was a companion in Planescape Torment. Mm -hmm. And frequently, his body parts have shown up, specifically his head, his eye, and his hand. Because the whole thing, the whole thing is that he, um, he's not all together. There's pieces of them all over the place yeah and one of those pieces is a big part of the fan campaign but i'm not gonna spoil that mm -hmm. and then again if you watch my soapbox i kind of already did 
Oops. And as a bit of an aside, I couldn't I couldn't help but be amused that the Ziggurat itself it looks very reminiscent to a um to a Latin American temple, specifically one that you might see from from the Mayans and Aztecs. You know, the people who were known for uh for their peaceful religious resolutions. A aka uh digging the hearts out of people to su to serve to their sun god mm -hmm. <laughs> by the way pro tip there you're you're in a you're in a city that worships its a tree called the sun tree and a god called the, the dawn father and you're pulling the most the, the epitome of shadow darkness and death in this sun god's city good fucking it's call well, it's, it's almost like they planned it that way because it, they probably had to, at the same time while summoning the Whispered One, also um, desecrate the lands of a, of a rival god. Would make sense, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. How, however, we you... You had that bit of good cop, bad cop, and I should note throughout all of this, every time that he, go every time that Percy decides to go into that no mercy mode, um, it gets worse and worse and a lot, le a lot um, more difficult to hide. Not only more difficult. That... Uh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say it, it, to the point that in this particular instance, everyone notices it. Doesn't exactly help that he has the black sclera with his eyes. Black yeah. sclera or black sclera orange irises. Mm -hmm. So they pull, they have Pike pull him aside, and she tries to see if she can sense whatever is inside of him because clearly there's something going on here. And oh yes, it's bad because whatever is whatever is control whatever is uh, corrupting him like this, it's a nasty son of a bitch. And again, since we don't really, they don't really talk about it much here. I think we have to kind of bring it up now. Well, See, they they bring a, they bring it up what it is later. Mm -hmm. They don't bring it up by name though. Once again, I get the feeling this was something they couldn't use the name for. No, because yeah, the name the, it, there is a name in the subtitles, but it's never used. Yeah, yeah, but or I don't think I, yeah I don't think they can they it in this case they don't they don't have to. Abandon it. There's nothing in in base in base D and D or, or Pathfinder that I could think of. Orthax was a creation of, on Mercer's part. Yeah, fair enough. Nonetheless, Orthax is the is the name of the demon, the shadow demon that he's basically made a deal with Percy so that Percy could make the list. And as an as an aside, um, I know I can't I can't help but wonder if. In in the creation of this, Mercy was taking Merc um, Mercer was taking some notes from Warhammer, because the way that the way that that demon works is not far removed from how chaos demons work, especially chaos demons of Zinch. I know some work with other other games with other besides D and D. It would not surprise me. Most D most DMs who most DMs and especially most forever DMs will not will not stick to just one aside from the grogs who I usually tell to fuck off will not stick to just one uh, ga game to fo game to focus with they'll d they'll um take notes from anything that they feel like taking notes from speaking from experience. So, uh, looking at it, um, Orthax is just the name given to a typical shadow demon from the Monster Manual in D&D 5e. Um, he had some of his stats pumped, it looked like. Or he, he was either that or a... F yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a shadow demon. And... So there was no reason they, they couldn't they could have used his name because the name is property of Matt Mercer, 
they just didn't mention it because, well, it wasn't really relevant to the the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Regardless, still a good idea to bring it up here. Yeah. Um, he's he's the shadow demon that has been enticing Percy since prior to meeting the Vox Machina, helping him inadvertently, uh, or inadvertently to, to Percy at least, very much intentionally from Orthax's end, um, provide him the list, provide him that pepper box. And, and and in return, whenever Percy uses it to kill one of the members, one of the names on the list, that rage and that need for vengeance, Orthax feeds off that shit. Yep. Uh, and the whole point is to make him avenging an avenger that constantly looks for more vengeance so that he can continue to feed and eventually just eat Percy whole. Yeah. Yeah. However, before we get to that, I th- I think we should talk. I think we should go into the confrontation and the betrayal to the point where I even called for the spoony button, which I don't usually do. <laughs> yeah, let's not use the spoony button again and say we didn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't planning to, but yeah. So basically, they work their way down towards the ziggurat, coming across the residuum refinery system that Doctor Anders had helped develop. And it's a giant acid vat. But of course, this is where we find out Cassandra has been keeping a few secrets from us. As she suddenly traps the gang, including Dr. Ripley, inside the, the refinery and sealing the doors. But Vax, Vaxel then gets through the door to try and help her. And Silas is right there to grab him and brainwash him again. Hello. Yeah, it's funny, Gro- Grog's the one that's more susceptible to getting brainwashed, and yet Vax is the poor sucker who keeps getting it. With this amount of brainwashing, I feel like we're back in Final Fantasy IV. Yeah, right? Um, Monk, fuck you. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, really? Kane Highwind in the Final Fantasy IV DS remake, which had all voice action, was voiced by, da 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 Liam O'Brien. <laughs> 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 Whoa. Why are you See, booing I me? Ca- I'm right. I'm still gonna boo you, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one who understood the reference! Oh, that's too perfect! That's too fucking perfect! <laughs> you only uh, use that you only use that meme because you're uh, black. Fuck oh, you! Get out of a burst! Oh no! No, oh. no, 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 Shades. He does this a lot with me. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. This is his this still, is the running gag. Still, if he's going to use that, I'm hitting this on him. Seems <laughs> fitting. <laughs> <laughs> one day, Shades. One day, I'm gonna rip out your e- your eardrums just so you understand how much pain that that song can cause. <laughs> you know, there's an urge for me to compound the pain, but I'm not because I'm too yeah. nice. Rest assured, well, you're Canadian, so that figures. Points. I just know not. I just don't. I just don't entice people to use them. Yeah. <laughs> that be that be well, sad. Anyway, 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 oh. Maddie. Right. Yeah. He- even the betrayal with the vet, with the vat of acid, which we have we have a bit of genre savviness with an acid trap, really. <laughs> oh. And then we go for the whole okay, oh yeah, let's just break let's just break the nozzle. That'll work. Uh, nope, only makes it worse. <laughs> which is which is kind of like sticking your finger in a tailpipe. Not a good yeah. idea. Or putting a banana in a tailpipe. <laughs> who puts yeah. who puts a banana in a tailpipe? Oh, uh, which speaking of that, speaking of that kind of thing, if you if you need an example of of that ho- of that whole blockage thing not working, um, let's consider what happened to Bad News when it fired once, was able to one shot a giant undead. But the problem is, um, too much powder. Yeah, he kind of overpacked that son of a bitch. It busted. And Zan and I know too well. Do not mess around with overpressure ammunition. Uh, Scott yeah, has to, been... 
If, if he crit, if he crit failed that, that would have blew up in his face. I mean, Scott did just recently test what an overpressure round does in Barrett M82A1, by the way. Yeah. Uh, it blows up more spectacularly than the RN50 did. So, overpressure rounds, guys. Don't do it. Always use the powder charge recommended for the round you're making. Or, you know, if you want to really know how, how things can go blow up, Mythbusters. Now, well, to be fair mm -hmm. to to Percy, this was, he, like, he's the only one who's ever made these kind of weapons. Not exactly a manual on how, how, how much powder to use for something like that. The doctor he's had kind of just, tried, but wasn't successful. Yeah, and she was copying off of his design, so he was the first. Thus, uh, kind of only have trial and error to work with there. Mm -hmm. It'll make the bad news better later. Yes. But, uh, regardless, through, with a little help, including uh, what has got to be the most badass seat of bravery, where Grog, li because they have three switches they have to pull simultaneously to open up the open up the uh, drain for the acid. Except the third switch is right next to the next to said drain, underneath Under. the acid. Yeah, let's let's actually call this two feats of bravery we've got grog diving into a, a literal lake of acid to go pull a switch what but fucking let's, naked but naked yes but let's not forget the fact that we have scanlan playing metal with scanlan's hand to keep everybody else above the acid mm -hmm. yeah motherfucker motherfucker uh really strained and, and girded his loins for that one <laughs> yeah, like like I've said before, when it's time to put put up or shut up with these guys, they when they come together, they can get shit done. And this was one of those moments right there where Percy was able to set aside his differences with Doctor Ripley to work with her to pull the switch. Gra Scanlan holding everybody up, playing the most badass metal riff you could possibly imagine, and Grog stripping down to dive into the acid. With only Pike keeping him healed so that he doesn't get eaten alive, just to get to that sw last switch to pull it. By the way, for those keeping score, Grog is the tank. Yeah, but even even he would have probably gotten destroyed if it wasn't for Pike. Mm-hmm. And. and <laughs> Lady K just messaged me again. Yeah, after the dra after the drain see after the after the acid drains, you know, Grog's kind of recovering. Pike comes up to him, and of course he's like, "Is my little buddy all right? Still intact? Oh, good." Gets to get all walk goes to get up and walk away. Oops, forgot my drawers. Yep. All right, the way he did is, oh, forgot my drawers. <laughs> <laughs> Travis was at a field day recording that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. But, but when once they actually get to the ziggurat, this is where they this is where we end up having your um, team fight. Yeah, not just though, your team not... fight, but it's a fight full of big damn hero moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, it starts off with Percy, who everyone else is like, "We're gonna sneak up on him." Percy's like, "Silence!" <laughs> well, the reason he's raging that hard, let's let's let's. Uh, Let's first mention Anna Ripley is starting to get away. So Orthax is like, shooter, shooter, shooter. And uh, Percy's like, no, they'll hear. And Orthax is like, fuck it, fine. Just go shoot him then. Yeah. You, you can clearly tell this that, that this is Orthax basically guiding him, saying, all right, fine. You know, fuck it. We'll just go after them then. And yeah, fuck the plan. Yeah. Ripley, Ripley gets away. So, Anna Ripley is not seen from this point on. Mm -hmm. We'll uh, see her again eventually, I'm sure. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But, uh, he is literally running, gun-raised, up the steps of the ziggurat, screaming their names. And, of course, the other's like, well, I guess so much for the element of surprise, and they all meet him up on the steps to basically yep. face them down. And that's when we get to the big fight. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Grog goes to charge Silas. Silas immediately throws him right back down the ziggurat. Oh, we actually, we forgot to mention one little thing about uh, Cassandra's betrayal. 
Because in doing so, her name is now the sixth barrel on the list. Yeah. Kind of comes into play here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, the fight breaks out. Um, Grog is thrown right back down the ziggurat. So, Grog's temporarily out of the fight. Scanlan goes to fight, or, or goes to help fight Silas, but Delilah silences him. Yeah. Um, so yeah. now now uh, Pike has to fight her and defend Scanlan at the same time. Um, of course, Vax is brainwashed, so her, him, and, him and his sister go at it. Yep, Vax and, Vax and Vex are fighting, uh, and Vex is trying to make little jokes about it, saying, you know, you always... You always uh, lost to me whenever we'd play fight and stuff like that. Um, and then she actually had to hurt him a few times and was like, "Please don't make me do this, Vax." It's it's a chao- it's a chaotic melee, and uh, eventually both Silas and Cassandra are on Percy at one point until uh, Key, who has been flung away across the room after trying well, to... Well, through, through all this, Percy's been dealing with Cassandra. Mm-hmm. It, well, Cassandra's been trying to get him while he's been trying to snipe shots at Silas while Silas is fighting. Uh, or or if he's not doing that, he's trying his best not to let not to let Orthax take over and shoot Cassandra. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's just this... It's, it's a big chaotic melee. Keyleth is thrown up into a wall and down onto a ledge. Um, eventually, though, Grog gets back up to fight Silas. Yeah. And Keyleth is on this ledge overseeing the battlefield. She can see how everybody's struggling. And finally, Grog full Nelson's Silas. Yeah, basically how it goes from here. Yeah, that ha- it does that. Grog holds up Silas while at the same time, Delilah, realizing her husband's in trouble, wants to stop. But by this point, Scanlan's gotten three of the of the of the silence, and then turns around and uh, gives her a receipt. <laughs> yep. Silence she her so she can't se- she can't protect her husband. Yep. And uh, and it's it's also just after Pike's astral form, or just no, no yeah, just, just before that was like just, near the end. Yeah, just before uh, 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 Pike's astral form completely disappears, um, Keyleth starts remembering things about you're their light now and the part where she talked to the sun tree in the cellar. And so she creates the biggest, brightest ball of sunlight she can. Uh, And Grog is like, do it! She's like, but you'll get burnt! He's like, do it! And, uh... Well, vaporizes Silas. Also gives Grog some pretty good burns. I mean, those burns he are really good. He got a good tan. He got, yeah. he, got, he got a little cooked there. But like he said, you know, this this isn't this isn't Piccolo shooting at Goku. This is just more like, yeah, she, he he needed to hold him down so that that would happen. And yeah, and of course because Silas is now completely dead, the curse on both Vax and Cassandra wear off. Yep. Vax is currently getting his face pummeled by his sister until he's like, wait a minute, I know who you are. I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm fine, you can stop! Yep, and then Cassandra oh, is... punch for sibling love. Punch. Yep. yep. And Cassandra and, and uh, Percy are, are finally no longer trying to... Well, one's no longer trying to murder the other. Um, <laughs> Pike comes around and heals the nice tan that uh, Grog got. But... Uh, Delilah has rushed inside the ziggurat to initiate the ritual it, because she wants Silas back again. Mm-hmm. She figures think- summon the whispered one, he'll bring her husband back. Yep. And now- they go they go up there. And the door is locked. But the keyhole's big enough that even they can see what's going on inside. Now, I believe it was at this point? No. It's not until they get inside that Pike's uh, body disappears. Yeah, because of what happens after... It's after everything goes down in there that everything that it happens. But basically, yeah. 
Uh, they run inside, or they eventually get in because, you know, Vax finally is able to open a door. <laughs> He's well, been able to open Vax. doors. And... Yeah. He hasn't had that much luck. He's had pretty shit luck when it comes to that. He, he was able to open doors when it came to them fighting the dragon, and he was able to open doors now when it counted. True. True. Mm -hmm. But they, they, they eventually make their way in, and unfortunately they can't really do much because Dahlia's got the, uh, Delilah's got the shield up that, only, that, that, that very little can get through. But Vex gets one lucky shot that just somehow managed to get past the shield and, str and take a shot at her. But... Delilah's not too happy about that. Fires a blast right at her, which would have killed her, except Keyleth made the sacrifice play. Yeah. And so Keyleth is essentially sitting there dying. Mm -hmm. And Vax earlier confessed his love to her, which she was like, now of all times? <laughs> um, He's like, God damn, we have to save her. And Vex is actually kind of heartbroken as well because this entire time she was kind of sniping at Keyleth because she didn't trust her and also there's that part of you of you can't take my brother away from me you're not family mm -hmm. busting but, balls busting but balls. after sacrificing herself to save vex uh vex is like okay yeah that was kind of that, that changed my mind and it's at that point that um that vax does the thing that Keyleth did with Cassandra earlier, remembering the, the herb, the mud, and the, the spit, plus a oh, little bit of later. magic. that was later. That was a little after. First, like, they first, they take down, uh, during, with the distraction, uh, Dal Delilah is able to summon the whisper. Actually, the herb and the spit was when they revived Cassandra. So that was before. Yeah, we're, we're getting to so that. And, and, and we'll get, give me a minute, give me a minute, I'll... I'll Delilah summons the Whispered One, but it, instead of it being the lich form, it's just this floating orb that's just spinning. Mm. It's doing nothing. Of course, Delilah's pissed. It's like, what? This is it? And of course, in the distraction, bam, bam. Yeah. Here, comes, here comes Percy. Now, at this point, Pike comes up and is like, okay, I can, I can heal her. I can heal her. I'm, I'm going to just take care of the... God. Yep. It wears Pike out at this point. Mm, I don't think it wore out, though. No, that was the exact moment, because she was trying to revive... She was trying to save Keyleth, and it is just as she's about to do it, but, that's when the astral projection wears out. But that's also right as the orb appeared, and as we find out when they try to use an elixir on Keyleth, the orb is blocking all magic. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. So I'm pretty sure it's the orb that pushed pushed her out. She was already starting to wear down a little bit, though. We noticed her flickering earlier in the in the earlier fight, so I think it's a combination of the two. But mm. you're not wrong. Yeah. So they so, they determine when the elixir doesn't work that the place is blocking magic. They drag everybody out, um, and convince all the way back Percy to the asset, all back to the refinery. Yep, and they convince Percy not to kill uh, not to kill Delilah at this time. Just drag her back so that you know. Yeah, you can and of find course, out that's more. when Vax decide, uh, remembers Keyleth's little healing thing and uses it on her. Vax, by the way. No, Vax is the one that used the healing bud. No, Vax is the guy. Oh. <laughs> Vaxeldan, and yeah. Vaxeldan and Vaxalia. Yeah, Vaxeldan and Vaxalia. This is, the pro this is the problem with twins. <laughs> hey, they made, they made a joke there the in the first episode. Anyway, anyway. But so he does yeah, remember Vax, it, and he, he tries to do it, but he needs somebody's magic to help. Mm -hmm. Which Scanlan provides, for funny enough. I mean, it's Scanlan. He, he may be all of the tropes of a bard, but he does care about the Vox Machina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so together they were able to, to just barely revive her from that. Well, but but they then... think she's dead, just like with a callback to Cassandra. Yeah, a little bit of that. But as, as she does finally start coming to, that's when Percy finally loses it. Mm -mm. And this is the part where earlier when Pike observed him, she said she couldn't see what it was, but it was clouding his soul. This is where he starts going absolutely ape shit. Orthax is trying to get him to kill uh, Delilah. And Vox Machin is like, N you keep, you, it gets, it's getting worse and worse. You can't keep doing this. Something's going to go wrong. And 
uh, everybody's questioning, you know, what the what is it? What's what is happening to him? And Keyleth, who did in fact get healed enough to revive, but it, who is in this kind of like half dead state, uh, crops up her head and says, "Can't you guys see? It's a demon." So it was it was a pretty good moment for her. I liked that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's when the fi- the final episode is really all about stopping Orthax because he, he yeah he is finally ta- he is taking over and to the point where even even though Percy himself is trying to resist Orthax is literally going into his head and digging up every cruel memory Percy has to uh, cloud his mind literally conjuring him up as illusions to make him shoot not only Delilah but even his own friends as they are now on the list. This is where I was really starting to get reminded of a of a um, chaos demon in Warhammer, because that because this is the way that this is the way that they operate. It's all about feeding that all about feeding them more and more. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, what that mo- what that more is ultimately depends on what that demon is affiliated with. Obviously, corn just w- just wants more blood. And he doesn't. He doesn't care who gets killed as long as some. As long as the blood flows, Zinch is obviously all about the planning. Um, Slanesh, well, you guys have seen Hellraiser, right? <laughs> yep. And also, we, um, since you mentioned the blood thing with Corn, uh, we should also mention that Silas's sword is now in Grog's possession. And that sword did the same kind of thing, where it soaked up any blood that it it, it cut. Mm-hmm. It also tried to talk to him for a moment. Oh well, we, I, I can guarantee you because I know season two is coming. They've already announced it. Yeah, that will come into play soon. I and have to it wonder will be though. Fucking hilarious! It will be hilarious because it is Grog, and also, I wonder. Do you guys believe the deck will get involved next season? Not next season, but eventually the deck will arrive. The dick has been stacked, Matty. (laughs) (laughs) For those those who know Dungeons and Dragons, you know the deck of many things. There's a a good way to make people cringe. (laughs) (laughs) Even even Lady (laughs) K's over here like, (laughs) Oh, and Mercer the Mad Lad gives it to Grog. Yeah. And you've seen the result of, of Grog using the deck. No. <laughs> I have nothing but grumbles and, and growls for the deck of many things. <laughs> it's it's a dick move in all situations, re- regardless of whether you get a good result or not. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> it's, it's at this point where... Uh, you know the the vox machina has to has to basically try and fight percy without killing him not an easy thing to do when he's constantly shooting at them shooting at them um te- um teleport teleporting about and it and is is strong enough to get to give even grog trouble also mm. got to call out a very fun mo- another like kind of fourth wall breaking moment, or at least a self awareness moment, where he's shooting up a storm and they're, they're like Vex and a few others are hiding behind cover, and, he, and she just goes like, "Well, he's got to run out of some time, right? He's got to reload sometime, yeah. He's got to reload sometime, but of course, since he's being possessed by the demon, the demon's basically just keeping the ammo stocked. Mm-hmm. Yep, and uh, it's actually a really, really enticing moment in the whole story it is especially because it starts setting up things for down the road because it's not just cassandra who is able to start getting through to him it's also vex yep percy and vex have had a few moments to talk to each other and vex has reminded percy again and again that it's not just his family that he has to rely on anymore he also has the Vox Machina. They're an anchor in his life, too. Yeah, and this this whole scene kind of uses both of those anchors to slowly start pulling him back. Yep. Uh, it, they eventually get the gun out of his hand, which 
ends the possession. Yeah. Though, and of course, they're starting to recover, and I gotta love what happens next. You know, they knock the gun out, but it's on the ground. And mm. the, the, the possession, you know, Orthax leaves his body, at least, and heads back, and unbeknownst to everybody else, he goes back into the list. Yep. Then they turn to deal with Cassandra again. Um, Percy talks about how he isn't going to kill her because, they you know. Delilah, not Cassandra. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. Excuse me. To deal with Delilah. Cassandra and Percy turn to deal with Delilah. And uh, Percy talks about how he isn't going to kill her and, you know, how, ev- you know, everything needs to be taken care of in a better way. And then Cassandra just straight up walks up to her and stabs her. Yeah, Del- but, Delilah I'm starts gonna monologuing. Kill everybody. Yeah, I'm going to do that. She got caught monologuing, really. <laughs> she got caught monologuing. And Cassandra just walks right up. My brother may forgive you, but I don't. Sing! Yep. After, after I, believe, that, I believe she said, I'm, I'm glad you forget you, you, you forgive her brother, but I cannot. Walks off yeah. like a badass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Now, and everyone's starting to gather things, and Percy goes to go pick up the list. But Scanlan grabs it first. And he goes, uh 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 It's like, oh come on, I don't like to possess, it's fine. Uh eh. Yoink tosses it into the acid. <laughs> Like, what are you done? I worked so hard on it. Our next body kind of comes out. Mandy, Mandy. Yeah. Never mind. Tries... Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah. He, he tries to reason with Scanlan. Scanlan makes like he's believing him, and he goes, nah, and throws it in the acid. And Orthax bursts out. And then in the end, he's asked, how did you know the demon was in there? Totally guessed. <laughs> totally guessed. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That was just perfect. And now, this leads us to the epilogue Mm -hmm. and the setup. Yeah. Because I know what's coming next. Anyone who's watched Critical Role knows what's coming next. But the gang returned back to Vasselheim, back to Amman, I should say, back to Amman. And they're resting in their keep until they're summoned to the to the Taldori, to the to the castle, where the leader of Amon as uh, makes an announcement that he's stepping down and uh, passing leadership to the council. Essentially, turning a constitutional monarchy into, I'd say, I'd say more of a constitutional Repu- republic. Yeah, it'd be a constitutional republic. However, as they're doing so, all of a sudden, Vex has another headache and a big one mm-hmm. and the bells of Taldore begin to ring and as they look off into the su- into the sunset they see at first what appears to be one but it ends up being four four dragons flying towards Amon each a different color black white a green black- and red a green a white, a black, and a red. Ladies and gentlemen, add in the blue that was uh, that they killed earlier, who was p- supposed to be part of this group, and I introduce you to the Chroma Conclave. Mm-hmm. And we will get into that when the next season drops. Because I'm... I'm fairly certain we're going to be doing this again when se- when season two drops. It's only a matter of time, and I yeah. am a very patient monk. <laughs> Indeed. So, good members of the parliament, I believe that th- this time, as the good herald of our group, I call upon you. We must now judge. But so- first, dear brother, mm-hmm. we must deliberate. We've only discussed. We've not deliberated on anything. Yeah. Indeed. So, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, the animation was handled by Titmouse, who's yes. handled a lot of animation works for Adult Swim over the years, and I think they've also done. I think they've also been Helper Studios for a bunch of other projects, as well as if I'm not mistaken, weren't they? Weren't they involved with the animation for Voltron Legendary Defender? I keep thinking they were, but uh, uh, hold on, I'm checking their I'm checking their website, I'm checking their Wikipedia page right now. They've done a shit ton of stuff as Titmouse. Yeah, like 
just just to the early one of the earliest examples to give you an idea of what kind of animation style we're dealing with here. Uh, how about a little series known as Megas XLR? Yep. Yeah, they were responsible for that. They Metalocalypse. Were... Mm -hmm. uh, but wait, 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 wait. You uh, you didn't never told me Vox Mighty Vox Machina dug giant robots. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the name, bro. I Come know. on. Anyway, uh, they did do some stuff for Adult Swim, like Super Jail and uh, Venture Laser Brothers and a couple other places. I'd say Black the vast Dynamite. majority of the William Street stuff they've been involved in in some form. Yeah. Um, they did the TMNT Half Shell Heroes series mm -hmm. for Nickelodeon. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for all the bigger names. Uncle Grandpa for Cartoon Network. The Epic Tales of Captain Underpants for DreamWorks. Yeah, hey, there you go. There you go. Yeah, Star Trek Lower Decks. Uh, they also helped with the new Animaniacs uh, series, the remake. Mm -hmm. the, and they're going to be helping with the Beavis and Butthead remake. Yeah. <laughs> Some things just don't need to be remade. But I won't get into that here. Yes, but they, they, they helped, they've done a they helped lot of with, big series. Mm -hmm. They helped with a show that I hate, but apparently a lot of people love. Neo Yokio. I haven't heard of that series, honestly. Also, they helped with a lot of the 2D animated sequences for both WandaVision and Loki. Yeah. They've done a lot of, of helping. Mm -hmm. um, where, uh, But they have been head animation for other things. Um, like... Shade said earlier, the Animaniacs remake is probably the biggest one there. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Titmouse did a lot of work. They did really well. Um. You can see the amount of love they put in the animation. Yeah, everything was really stylized. They did use some CG, but it was very, very restrained. I'd Most say... of it was for effects, from what I saw. Yeah, there was Things... a couple of CGI creatures here and there, but they were very used very sparingly. I'd say it was mostly th the mo the only time it was really blatant was with the dragon, and they did yeah. it well with the dragon. Mm -hmm. They did yeah. really well with the dragon. It, it was a it was a kind of a subtle thing. Like first of all, it was mostly in dark areas, so you know you could it could blend in a little bit better. It wasn't so obvious that it was CG. I mean, even even in the shot, even in the shots at the end with the with the Chroma Conclave, like they were usually like silhouetted, or had the sun uh, in an area where you couldn't see them as clearly, so it was hard to see it being CG. But it was used to good effect that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they knew what they were doing with the little CG they used in order to achieve the best effect with it. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so. Within the animation, we have quality. We have quality stretch and squash for the comedic moments. We have quality Sakuga. Oh, God, the action sequences were brilliant. Oh. And of course, as we've stated time and again, we have quality gore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they did not skimp on that fart. I'd say it's if there's if there's any elephant if there's any elephant in the room that might be a stumbling point for some people. It's going to be two things. One is the fact that when it comes to the when it comes to the gore, they do not skimp out on that. Um, some so for those who, for those who are really really squeamish, i.e., uh, or or for the i.e. those who prop who probably probably don't watch Lucio Fulci movies, um, yeah. that's going to be a, that's going to be a point a point of um, concern. The other is that. I've seen some people regard the regard the humor as crass. Uh, yeah, I have one thing watch to say about Critical that. Critical Role. Yeah, have you That's guys actually watched Critical Role? Uh, trust me, they actually are holding back. <laughs> if I'm being yeah. honest, I look at the when it comes to whether or not the humor is crass. I'm much like with much like with the Mecca is dead argument. I.e., why I keep why I keep po why I keep poking fun at Gigek, and I will continue to poke fun at him. Um. I am not so much interested in the argument itself, but in the people making it. And I think with a lot of people making it, they um they are they are looking at this as a as a fa as a fantasy adventure and are overlooking the fact that this is based on a D and D campaign. 
And yeah. I'd also like to point out that the idea of a fantasy adventure show being based on a D&D campaign is not new. Oh, I can yeah. name two anime off the top of my head that, st- that dabbled with this idea. Record of Lotus War and Slayers handled both extremes of that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Goblin Slayer. Goblin All Slayers. of Goblin Slayer is, is based off of D&D that the, that the author played. Also, um, Thunderbolt Fantasy. <laughs> yeah. How sad and, is yeah, it? Yeah, kind of a lot of people mm-hmm. forget. Yes, a lot of fantasy. People, people still think of the fantasy genre as, oh, it needs to be ultra serious, and it needs to be this, it needs to be that. No. You can have fun with this shit. Vox Machina is a, the legend of Vox Machina is a proof of that. Or well, at least and, proof of concept. And and as always, as a as ironic as this statement is, considering we're in a monastery, uh, we disapprove of design by gospel. Whether that means designing the game or designing your story by gospel. And for what it's worth, I should ex- for those who aren't aware. Designed by gospel is a concept that I've used for years. That is basically when you're do- when in a creative work, you're doing cer- you're doing certain actions, certain certain moti- certain motifs, certain design points of emphasis, whatever. Not because it's what fits your ultimate goal or the story that you're trying to tell, but because it's be- it's what's been done. It's what worked before. And to give you an idea of how this always backfires, after the Lord of the Rings trilogy blew the fuck up, we had a slew of people trying to crib off that formula, making super serious fantasy stories for, like, years. How many of those actually succeeded? A very, very small portion. And that very, very small portion... Uh, succeeded because while they were making super serious fantasy, it was executed in a much different manner. Exactly. This is why Design by Gospel never works. Just because it worked for them doesn't guarantee it's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. The only thing that works for you is what you honestly want to make. If If you can make something that fits you and is fun and enjoyable, the audience will feel that and be drawn to it. The reason why Vox Machina works in this regard is that because it was based on a D&D campaign that these that these voice actors played in. They created this world. They created this story. So they knew how to treat it. And, and they gave they treated it with all the love they had put into that campaign. Mm-hmm. And it shows. Yeah. It's it's no mistake that Vox Machina uh despite some minor gripes I'll talk about later uh, was so successful and so heartfelt. Uh, this, the whole thing's a passion project. The entire thing is a passion project, regardless of the fact that they got $11 million, regardless of the fact that Amazon picked them up. E- e- even if none of that had happened, if they had just gotten the small $750,000 they wanted, but yeah, and yes, that's, again, very small for an animation budget. The whatever one episode short they would have come up with would have been just as passionate. Yeah. But this also means that because they were the ones that were also producing this, they made sure to figure out what was essential. This is something that I think a lot of other show a lot of other adaptations fail at. And this is something we've brought up before. Mm-hmm. Is the idea of we mentioned before how names were changed, but there were also little things here and there that were either condensed or changed to fit into this animation story. Mm-hmm. The most glaring but, being that Trinket was not around for most of the animation. Yeah, which I don't know, understandable, but there were other little things here and there. But the point I'm getting at is what they didn't change were the essentials. The story was pretty much spot on from the original. A lot of there were a lot of key moments that didn't change things that make the story work you know there's a few key lines that percy says like when he's when he's when he's got the gun up to dr anders the first time and he's talking him down he says a very specific line you're the yours is the face i saw when murder entered my heart that was something that Tallison said in the campaign almost word for word Mm mm-hmm 
And it, it really was a defining moment for Percy. So leaving that line in was essential. There are certain lines you could take out or add in to add flair and stuff like that, and that's fine. Like, I, you know, throwing in the I would like to rage from Grog, you know, that's a fun little thing, but it doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. But having that line or another line later on when they're talk when, uh, they f when Percy finally agrees to not shoot Dr. Ripley the first time, he, it's slight, it's only slightly altered, but the line is still pretty much the same. It's like, right now, you are the luckiest person in Whitestone. Do you know why? Because you're at the bottom of my list. Yeah. And, uh, and the, another thing with, with the little fan favorites they add, such as, again, I would like to rage, um, they didn't overstay their welcome, and they didn't become overused. They didn't become catchphrases. No. Grog says it that one time because the people expected him to say it at some point, but they didn't keep doing it. Even in times where he was going into a rage, like when he breaks into the uh, in that one house, he goes into a rage. You see his veins pop, making it clear he was going into a rage, but he didn't say the line there. And they could have easily put that there, and you, you would and, and it would have been fine. But they didn't because they didn't need to. Yeah, it wasn't essential. They, they they gave it they gave it its its time in the light for the fun because they wanted to get you the the essence of who these characters were and then they expanded upon them in the larger uh, Briarwood arc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with the story uh being so close to the key beats anyone who's already watched or read summaries of the actual campaign uh, knows what to expect and feels the same things they felt when they first watched the campaign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've well, I've gone back prior, before and after watching Box Machina and watched clips of the campaign on YouTube. Trust me, they're not fucking hard to find. There's compilations and clips out there everywhere. And I've seen a lot of these key moments and how they played out in the original campaign. Like I said earlier, I saw the scene with the family getting hung up to look like Vox Machina hanging off the sun tree. I saw the clip of that scene from the actual campaign. And it was just as powerful in the animation as it was in the original campaign. Mm -hmm. the, the players' faces, as Mercer described that fucking scene. Oh my god. Yeah. That's, that was, they understood that that was the feeling they had to capture. That, that feeling of, holy shit, that's them. What the fuck? Like, that's something that only someone who understood the story that that had created could honestly have captured that well. And that's and the fact that it was the people who played that campaign and lived that moment, they were the only ones who could have captured it that good. Mm -hmm. And the key, th the key thing with all, with all of this is... Have, is having that having that level of ca of care to try and get everything as right as possible. No one ex no one expects one to one transitions unless you're um unless you're pure unless you're a certain type of purist, i.e. the grogs. But as I've said, before, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was, I was actually gonna take a moment to comment on this. Like, this is something I've said before in other geek watches, and I'm gonna emphasize it here. You should not do a one to one trans uh, adaptation. That doesn't work, because if you tried to... Well, first of all, if you tried to do a true one-to-one -one adaptation of this, you'd have several hours of nothing happening. <laughs> nobody wants that! I don't care who you are, nobody wants that! So things were going to be changed. But what I've always stressed when it comes to shows like this, is with adaptations like this, is that what matters is that you capture the soul of the original. Mm -hmm. And that's the trickier part, is knowing what the soul of the work is and being able to adapt that. And within, and I'd say, I'd say within, I'd say within that, I mentioned, I mentioned this beforehand, but I do think it was a very smart move, and I'd like to see more series do this as time goes on. Of staggering the release of episodes. For one, obviously it makes our job easier, but for two, you're able to 
can, you're you're able to um, prevent the burn through a little bit more quickly. If you look at if you look at the way the the binge batch setup is gone, you get a fair few people talking about a show and then it and then it just gets pushed under the wayside until it comes back. And yep. I distinctly remember talking about five or six years ago how that particular strategy was going to was going to run its course in due time. Simply because you're either going to you're either going to run out of um, story to tell because of that whole what comes next thing, or you, or you're go <clears throat> or you're going to suffer from a far more direct version of seasonal rot. Yeah, and uh, I, I I'm even with streaming uh, streaming uh, platforms in place, uh, we haven't seen some companies broadcast companies are both here in the West and around the world um, move to streaming simply because they realize that the weekly format is still fitting them better. And I, and if I'm if I'm being honest, I am per, I am perfectly fine with that. I mean, I'm still watching Revice, so <laughs> you know my answer. Yeah, yeah. Large I mean, shows benefit from that better. It's the hybridization of, of the fact that for some networks they realize that the weekly stuff still works, but you got to cater to the people who want to cut the cable because you're too fucking expensive. Mm -hmm. I also think this was a technological element. I get the feeling that when streaming services were uh, in the in the first several years, they really weren't able to schedule releases. Like even YouTube didn't ha have that. Like we're able to schedule releases like that. They've only now, only in the last few years, have they really started doing that. So I get the mm -hmm. feeling early on, a lot of studios didn't really know how to do that. So it's just easier for them to either not put it on a streaming service or to just bat throw it all out at once. But as time there, has gone on, that has changed. Yeah, a compromise was reached, and there's a harmony to that to that compromise. Yeah, more more and more streaming services are able to do staggered schedule releases. I mean, Funimation, Crunchyroll, they're able to do it without any problems. And now Netflix, Hulu, and all the other services are starting to get to that point where they can do weekly releases instead of doing it all at once. And that's going to end up creating a nice little balance where if a show doesn't need to be released all at once, it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. And this is a good proof of that working. Because, yeah, it still came out pretty quickly, but it's it was a short series anyway. It was going to be quick no matter what, but it was long enough for people to be able to digest and process each batch of episodes before the next one came out. And that ends up helping things stick in people's minds better. Mm-hmm. Also gets people thinking about their favorite moments and other things like that. Yeah, I mean, look, yeah. look at us talking about it now. How much a lot of that, you know, yeah, we forgot things here and there, but how many of that, how much of that was easily just popping up in our heads? Like, yes. just recalling it instantly. That's the kind of thing you want to have. We may have gotten the placement on the timelines incorrect from time to time, but the events themselves stayed with us. Yeah. Yes. And this is this is where one th i am i am optimistic about se about season 2 and i and given the fact that amazon isn't exactly swimming in options um they don't you're pro you're probably not, you're probably going to see them largely le largely left alone especially since if worse comes to worse they could probably just say well we're, well we're going to run another crowdfund for 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 future episodes um or, oh yeah, they get they get it. I don't they'd be think able they're going to need to do another crowdfund. I'm pretty sure if Amazon's going to bankroll the shit out of this, especially well. especially since they're again they're not ex they're um they're not exactly paralyzed by choice right now. Yeah, <laughs> the um I think the point that uh, Monk was getting at Shades though is that Amazon isn't going to interfere with the process since the process works. Um, and given that, if, the, given that no more, even people who don't like watch Critical Role or don't play D and D are getting into this. Like, true fact, I was talking with my uh, father in law the other day. He was calling me up to celebrate my birthday, and I had mentioned I had suggested Box Machinum, and he told me straight up, like, "Oh yeah, I'd been seeing that. I was interested in watching that." He doesn't watch Critical Role. He doesn't know anything about that. 
and yet he was interested in seeing this. He was curious about this show. How many other people are like that who probably have never heard of Critical Role, probably don't know about you know D and don't know D and D as well as we do, and yet they saw how cool this looked, and they're hearing everyone singing its fucking praises like we are right now, and are like, okay, I want to check this out. You know, there's going to be an even bigger audience for season two. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be hard for them. The only thing I wish for is that people don't expect them to to uh, to go higher. The the constant um, outdoing yourself expectations honestly are fucking toxic in all of entertainment. Yeah. Um, expect the next season. To be its own thing. That is my, that is my advice to any viewer. Always expect the next season, wh- whatever denomination is being used for uh, how a, a piece of media is being divided. Uh, always expect that next installation to be its own thing. Even if it fits into a larger overarching narrative. It's not it, it's not fair to expect somebody to top themselves every time. In fact, the the uh, the Chroma Conclave good stuff. Um not at all the same as the Briarwood arc. So there are people I can almost guarantee who might go into the next season disappointed because it isn't more of the same. No, but that's the thing. The f- uh, uh, first season, you you had the, the first two episodes of an introduction, your standard plot, and then fantasy horror. That's pretty much what it was. Now we're into fantasy action movie. At least that's what it looks like. Mm-hmm. We'll see you with so season far. two. Yeah. But ultimately... Viewers should go into any next installation, and and so specifically with season two of Vox Machina, expecting it to be its own thing. Judge it on its own merits. Mm-hmm. You don't have to judge it in vacuum. That's not what I'm saying. But you you should judge it on its own merits, and don't constantly make callback comparisons. Oh, oh, definitely. I think the only big issue that we all agreed on when we finished watching with the show was the music, the soundtrack. Yeah, that's the big problem. And this is some this is something that I've uh, since I've delved more and more into 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 soundtrack design. Um this is something that has that I've been giving more and more thought. And that it that is um that is providing an i the way you can use music to provide an identity. Um, I'll use a I'll use a good and a bad example in po- in popular media for this kind of thing. With a good soundtrack, whether that be from whether that be from o- from O'Donnell, in the ca- in the case of, in the case of the Halo theme, which anybody. If if is for Zan and I, oh, <laughs> as an aside, there's there's a video of a of a bunch of Gregorian monks do, doing the Halo theme in a full on ch- in a full on church. Yes, <laughs> Gregorian monks in a cathedral singing the Halo theme. It's mm-hmm. fucking brilliant. Yeah, some damn good acoustics too. I mean, cathedrals are designed for it. Yeah, but. Or, and there's plenty. There's plenty of other examples I can get. But the point is, you can under you can conjure in your mind certain scenes and the like from hearing those tracks, even if you're not watching or playing the source material from it. Hell, even Critical Role itself had a soundtrack that, as soon as you hear it, you got moments popping in your head. Like when you hear, like if you listen to the main theme that I used in my soapbox. Mm-hmm. As soon as you hear it, you're already picturing things in your head. Same goes with the other theme songs they use, like Your Turn to Roll or It's Thursday Night. As soon as you're hearing those songs, you're hearing, you're picturing those moments. Mm-hmm. And 
This is also why a whole a whole discussion can be had on opening themes regarding, say, um, Common Rider. <laughs> Which, Toku in general. <laughs> yeah. Toku in gen Toku in general, but I especially but I especially want to go with that instead of Super Sentai because it hasn't fallen it hasn't fallen too far into the de into the cer into certain problems I have with certain Sentai openings, mm, namely monk. Break, namely breaking the damn song. Uh, Monk, <clears throat> I do have to, by uh, uh, for legal purposes, mention one Super Sentai opening. Which one? Decker Ranger. Uh, yeah. You hear that song, there's no doubt in your mind what's appearing. Fucking Decker Ranger. It, do yeah. it doesn't hurt that Psychic Lover's the one who did the song. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> now, but that be that being said, this is a bad example. Since I brought up a good example with Halo, would be the soundtrack that Kazuma Junichi did for Halo Five Guardians, which is already already we're not exactly batting a thousand on that front. <laughs> but the Monk, reason my eye is twitching. The reason I bring that up is a vast over reliance on strings without a whole lot of identity. And it's telling that the best song, the best song on that soundtrack is the Trials, which is a re which is a remix of of the of the Halo theme. The only good song on the OST. And I'm perfectly fine with using strings. I like strings. I love violins. The problem is, is that the str is that the string gets really repetitive and really overused. Yeah, actually. I can give you another good example of uh, uh, good and bad soundtrack from the same franchise, and it's also video games. The Super NES Mega Man X games. Mm. The first one had an amazing mix of stuff with a good electric guitar as the main instrument, but there was all these other instruments that played with it, all these other things that certain tra sages had that were amazing. Mega Man X 2 and 3, however, started to really emphasize that electric guitar, and... It stopped being as novel. The key thing with all this is musical identity. And the pro and this is where we have the problem. The the opening and a lot of a lot of the music within within the series is very incidental. It sets it sets an appropriate ambiance, but it never ascends beyond that. Yeah, it's it's the equivalent of here is generic fantasy town theme for being in town. Here is generic fantasy horror theme for some of the horror parts. Here is generic uh, dark fantasy drama theme for when Percy's being No Mercy Percy. They didn't even give No Mercy Percy his own goddamn theme. Now... If you listen closely throughout some of these tracks, you occasionally hear a little bit of the of your turn to roll kind of mixed into these orchestrated themes, but it's so subtle that it kind of just blends in with everything else. You almost can't even tell it's there unless you're really paying attention. Like you watch the op you watch you listen to the opening song and it's there. But you, it's not, and it doesn't stand out. It doesn't jump out at you like this is a critical role song. It's just, just this nice little touch that is like, oh, if you're a critical role fan, you'll recognize it. But it's not jumping out at you. Mm -hmm. Oh, an obvious. Uh, now, one might one might argue that music is supposed to is supposed to set atmosphere, but I think a lot of people underestimate the value of music as its own character. That's the reason why I'm har why I'm harping on this. I really do feel. I really do feel that the soundtrack, the soundtrack that you that is used in this, is the kind of thing you would hear in something like si um, the Sirenscape app, which, for the record, is a very good app when you're doing t when you're doing campaigns. I've I've used it my fair share of times, even though I later um, shifted into my into my own soundtrack. Um, yeah. Good friend. Good friend of the mo good friend of the of the monastery, Wade Dyer, who will be probably talking to in the next few weeks he ha he um he has a set he has a set of instrument of sound of soundtrack bits for the different factions within fragged empire 
and hell, I've hell you. Some of you may recall that big ass twenty six hour um, so, um soundtrack collection I d I did for my own games. And in each of in each of those, there is a there is a sense of identity. But if so, if you were to li but if you were to listen to tracks off of the Critical Role OST, completely absent of watching, how many of those tracks could you act could you actively connect with events on screen? Um, I'm not sure on that one. That's, that's kind of the, that's kind of the point. Yeah, and I'd say the biggest offender on this, oddly enough, is the opening theme. It's very, very generic. Yeah, the the opening almost relies entirely on the visuals to capture you because the uh, the music doesn't. Like I said, aside from a very subtle inclusion of some chords from your turn to roll, and again, you have to listen for them because it's definitely been mi mixed up a bit. But it's not enough to, to, to stand out amongst any other kind of orchestraic song you've heard. Like, if you didn't know what your turn to roll sounded like, you probably wouldn't even have realized that was there. Yep. So, and uh, all I have to say is for a season two, um, Matt, find, find some finds. I hope you are able to, to get in contact with some, with some music YouTubers and have them help out. Or actually, you know, you know, tell Sam and Travis that they're executive producers. Mm -hmm. Or you know, just uh, just reach out, a, reach out a finger, uh, reach reach out a finger, and, and see if uh, Hideyuki Sawano's available. I doubt they'd get Sawano. <laughs> oh come on! <laughs> Can't a man dream? You can dream, but, doesn't mean it's gonna happen. But yeah, dream in one hand, spit shit in the other. Which one's gonna fill up first? Neither. I have a toilet for the shit. But I would I would say um, call up Family Jewels. You know, hold on, hold on, I, hold on. I'm I'm think. Hold on. If he's gonna contact Family Jewels, he's gonna get all of those cover artists. You realize, Monk, Caleb oh. Hiles, Jonathan Young, uh, Liz Rubnett, whole bunch of people. Hell, Adrian and Figueroa would probably be really good for this. Or Little V. Yeah, <laughs> Little V Mills. Mm -hmm. Another an, uh, that would that would appeal to Maddie's taste. He's also a Canuck. Well, it all <laughs> no. Well, the big reason I <laughs> the the other big reason I bring up Little V is um two words battle cry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because <laughs> if if someone if someone were to approach me and, and ask how some how a soundtrack like this should be done. I am of the opinion that each character that if, that people are seeing on screen, and each of each of the major each of the major characters that you saw in say season one, should have a musical character, a light motif. Yeah, mm. that's yeah. I was about to say the exact same term, light motif, because that you know because you take you can take a certain melody and change it around to fit whatever mood. You can have the same song, in, but in like a softer tone. For those heartfelt moments, uh, a spookier tone for the horror moments, and a more bombastic version for the action scenes, and have it kind of mi and in a way that they can mix into each other. Like you get a moment with Grog swinging around, you get this bombastic, just powerful theme, and then you cut to Pike, and you've got something that's a little more, you know, a little more religious sounding, a little more holy sounding. Mm -hmm. But and then for Scanlan, you play Beats of Love. <laughs> The only good part of the of the uh, Vox Machina OST that I had to point out. Pull my beats. And you know what? You could. You could have like you know, an instrumental version of that going on where it mixes in. So you're not entirely wrong. <laughs> as, an, as an aside, pull my... I don't know why, but when I heard pull my beads, I kept thinking of James Brown. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Well, no, I, knowing how Sam Regal is, he probably did take some inspiration from that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I am not touching that topic with a 10 foot pole with someone else pushing it. <laughs> yeah, let's. That's, I think at that that's, point, I, I think it's time to, uh, you know. Zan, that's because yeah, you're not yeah. black enough. <laughs> <laughs> but you and see, you there's your payoff, ladies and gentlemen. 
may you know that's fine by me if i were if i were as black as you that'd just be too much darkness a Chappelle show joke <laughs> Yes. That sounds like a Chappelle show joke. Yes. It was. <laughs> it absolutely was. Brother's <laughs> Darkness. Brother's Darkness. I'm not dark enough to be Brother's Darkness. That's okay. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> with, but with that in, with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, with all the with all the deliberation that we've do, that we've done tonight. I think I think we've I th after exhausting every topic that we can. I think this is a good a good point to render our final judgments. All right, members of the parliament present, I call upon you for your final verdicts one by one. As you are the master of the temple, I first go to you, monk. I vote Weeb. Despite some, despite some hurdles, this is still a pretty damn impressive project, and I look forward to seeing what's gonna ha what's gonna happen in a year or so when we get the next season. All right, we have a vote of weeb from the monk. Next, it falls to you, Brother Shades. <laughs> Very well. I proclaim this show to be weeb because it is a good recreation. I feel like. As someone who has seen some of these moments, to see them played out like this, it was a very well done adaptation. Has a few hiccups, a few things it can fix in season two, but since we know season two is coming, those fixes should definitely be happening. And I am looking forward to seeing what this, how the Chroma Conclave will be adapted. Definitely a weep for me. All right, and to you, brother Maddie, your verdict, Mister Speaker. Would would the uh, would the Brotherhood agree that this will be a sweep? As I will say, this is weeb. All right. Well, as for myself, I also vote this show weeb on the account of it, the fact that the passion of the creators is well evident, and we have a path and course for success. Thus. It is four weeb, zero scrub. In this case, the legend of Vox Machina be weeb. <laughs> I love doing that, the Mr. Speaker thing, because that's a Parliament thing, by the way. <laughs> Won't be doing it all the time, but there you go. Yep. And I'd say I'd say I'd say that about I'd say that about covers that about covers everything for this pilot episode of the Parliament of Geeks. We will likely be back in about two weeks with something that is go is going to be is going to be a little more apropos of the ter of the term weeb or scrub. <laughs> however, I will not. However, I will. It will not be a comical tone. So, oh, no. as Yoshi P would say, please look forward to it. And if I may, uh, Mr. Monk. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to hear your feedback. What do you think of our little pilot here? What do you, what, 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 what do, you think we should do to make this show even more fun? Mm -hmm. Give us your and if you have a show to suggest, throw it in there. We'll probably throw, throw, throw it on the maybe pal for like 10 years from now. Now do the whole YouTube thing. Like, comment, subscribe. You know the jizz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but with all that said... Until next, until next, we are gathered he here in Parliament. My name is Mildra, and on behalf of the good brothers here, present and not present, I would advise you all to stay fucking frosty. We're adjourned.